You are listening to the bomb hole. From the top, it's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. The bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another episode of The Bomb Hole presented by Wild Mike's Ultimate Pizza, Solomon, and Pub Beer. Now, Stony Buds, how are we doing today? So good, dog. Love hearing that. Well, this week is special. We have the world's first skier in the booth, and he happens to be one of the greatest to ever do it. Tanner Hall, what's going on? Chilling, man. Thanks for having me. We are happy to have you. For the listeners that can't see, uh, you just destroyed your Achilles, correct? Yes. Yes, I was uh, out filming in Minnesota in Minneapolis, and uh, I was trying to film a real ski part this year for X Games, and you know, on the 2nd of January, like midnight, I just landed pretty far forward in a little wall tranny, and I was trying to land switch, and I just came off. I think I caught my foot on, like, the cement or something. Something funky happened because, like, midair, I just started, like, leaning really far forward. And I wasn't, like, I was kind of diagonal coming into the landing. And just when I landed, was, yeah, one ski popped off and one didn't. So the one that didn't just, yeah, snapped it. And it was really weird because, you know, I've been hurt twice before this. But I've, like, you know, in 2005, I broke both ankles and both heels. And in 2009, I broke both tibia plateaus and tore both ACLs at the same time. So, like, my pain tolerance and, like, perspective is, like, bilateral. So, just, like, doing one one thing without, like, no bones breaking or anything, it's it was kind of confusing. Like, I didn't even really realize it until I took my foot off. Like, my I, I took my own ski boot off, got the sock off, and then when I saw, like, this huge divot in my Achilles tendon, that's where it like, kind of hit me, and it's when the emotion started running wild. Yeah, they say that's uh, one of the worst injuries possible for an athlete, correct? I mean, yeah, for sure. But, like, again, I'm going to go back to the perspective and, like, I mean, when you break both your legs and tear both your ACLs, like, you don't really notice how much movement you got in a joint like your knee. It's like your shoulder, you know, you got – and shoulder's even worse, but the knee is – like, there's a lot of movement in it, you know what I mean? So to get all that movement back and then have, like, the confidence come back after the movement does is – uh. It was just a lot different. That took a long time, dude. It was really debilitating for me. Like, I couldn't even take a piss or, like, take a shit without, like, really excruciating pain. So, for this one, it's, like, really tough. And it's, like, after I got surgery, like, I got hurt at midnight. I was at the airport by, like, 5 in the morning, on a flight by 6, in Salt Lake by, like, 7.30 in the morning. And then, in 24 hours, I was in surgery. And so, like, coming out of surgery, Doc's looking at me kind of like, you know, this... He, he he knew my 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 injury record and in the history, so he's kind of like, yo, your pain tolerance is kind of bananas. I'm pretty sure, and you just got to realize that this is not gonna. There's not gonna be a lot of pain. There's not gonna be a lot of swelling, but it's really like debilitating on the mind just because of the length of it. And they're saying like the first three to four months, you just can't really do anything, because if I were to like, if I like slipped on my right foot and I put my left foot down pretty hard, like that's what they're saying. It's just it's it's so weak that it can snap. But once you make it out of that first four months, then you're in the clear. And then it's just all time to strengthen. Mm-hmm. But when you're just chilling for four straight months, you know, it's like the atrophy and everything. Like, it's you, can, you you get weak. You know what I mean? If you snap it again, do you have to start all over? Yeah. So you're on three-week mark right now? Is that where you're at? Yeah, three weeks uh, from yesterday out of surgery. And then I crashed uh, three weeks ago from Sunday. And it's dope, you know what I mean? Because... It, with injuries, like, lifestyle changes happen. I mean, last summer I stopped putting tobacco in my weed. And just in doing that, like, taking tobacco out of my life, like, I started smoking a whole lot less and started, like, kind of getting on a way healthier program, I feel like. But then, like, I don't know. Winter time came around. I started putting tobacco in my joints again. And then just, you know, the day I crashed, I know, like, how bad tobacco is really. It's like alcohol. It's poison for healing time. Just cre- cre- creates carbon monoxide in your blood, slows down your blood flow. And in a place like the ankle or the knee where there's like not any blood flowing through it. So I was like, you know, it's good. It's like, for me, I just got to look at it. Like I've been through it before. It really sucks because the momentum was coming. Like I, yeah, I was on it. I was skiing better than I ever have. And at 37, it's kind of nuts. You know what I mean? Especially with everything I've been through, but sometimes you just got to look at like a blessing in disguise, you know? 
Totally. Uh, one thing I thought was completely fascinating, you were talking uh, off camera, is that you've been going to Las Vegas, and what have you been doing down there? Yeah, well, I've been hanging out with this girl for a little bit, and she's uh, she works at a place called Ageless Forever, and uh, it's it's a wild place of, like, stem cell injections, and they've got this thing called M-Wave, or it's not, that's not what it's called, but that's like the name they have it. There's a, like a specific name for it, but it's like a magnetic or it's a radio, it's radio, it's radio shock therapy really. And it's like, they've got like this wand and it sounds like if you're like trying to hook up something electrical and you get those weird kind of staticky noises. And then she just starts, so like they just start rubbing it on places where you got some swelling or like any little minor injuries. And all it's supposed to do is like create crazy rapid blood flow. So I went down last weekend and on Saturday, or no, it was Friday. I got the stem cell injections. And then on Sunday morning, we went back there and she did the M wave on my ankle and my knees and my hips. And it's, it's insane, dude. It's really crazy. Like that was the first time. Cause like when I hurt my knees, I was going to Mexico to get like, injections of something that I don't even really know what it was. <laughs> yeah, who, who, nobody probably knew. <laughs> no. And I was getting injected by, like, a dude who was, like, fucking 99 years old or 100 years old. He was from, his name was Mil Nongli. He was from uh, New Zealand, so I think Auckland. And he had a crazy story, bro. He was, like, I think he was doing injections in Vegas at first. And then, like, I'm not lying. I think you can look this up. Like, he came home one day, and I think somebody, like, had broken into his house and was, like, in the middle of raping his wife or something, which it was it was so heavy. Whoa. And I'm hearing this, and I'm like, holy smokes. The dude ends up, like, getting a gun out, and I think he shot, he shot the dude who was doing, like, whatever he was doing to his wife. And just through that, like, he, he had to move out of the United States because of all the courts and all the stuff that was going on. And then he had to explain, like, just through that scenario, like, what his injections were, and, like, people started... And the courts being like, wait a second here. You're doing what to people? And this is not approved by the FDA. And so I think he jetted down to Mexico and it just in Rosarita. And so like, yeah, I was tripping, man. I would I, I would go down there and I'd rent a, I'd fly into San Diego. I'd rent a car. I'd drive through the border. I'd show up in Rosarita in this little tiny room that's like a little cement room, cracks all over the wall. Doesn't really look all that nice. And you open the door and this tiny little man, like... Old as shit. Just opens the door and you go in. You start talking to him. He like wants to get to know you as a person, and then once he has a good feel about you, he's like, whenever he's ready, he tells you to lay down. And bro, like needles like this long, and you can check it out. I've got it was on YouTube. For the viewers, it's, like, it's about our listeners is about twelve inch needle. Yo, it's insane because his his style of injecting, like he would stab me with the needle, and then all of a sudden he would really start wrenching on it, and you'd see the needle wrenching on the needle. Oh, yeah, wrenching and, like, putting it inside of you where in my knee, homie was, like, bending the needle, and it and it got to the point where I was just, like, looking at it. It got so gnarly, and then every time after, I was like, yo, what is the purpose of, like, like the harshness of, like, your technique? Like, you you, 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 you don't think just going in and, like, you know, because so you're looking at me like you're 100 years old, dude. Like, is that, like, your brain kind of screwing up? And he's claiming, like, he was breaking down scar tissue, and he was, like, getting it into the part of the joint that he needed it to. And so, like, it was just a little bit weird, and that's why I think I didn't want to go have any, like, PRP injections. I didn't want to do stem cell. I didn't want to do anything because my injection experience in 2009 was a little bit different than most. And so, I don't know, when I started looking into stem cells a little bit, I still don't really understand, like, what they are, what they do. But I just know that I've heard some pretty good success stories about it. And I'm at that age, like we were talking earlier, at 37, you kind of start looking at, like, arthritis and, like, you know, we put our bodies through a lot. Especially you know. with what you've done in, yeah. in your uh, career, your length of time. 100. So it's like to get down to Vegas and have this go around of injections was so mellow, man. They put it just the needle right in, just barely in. And it was like, it was like almost when you get your blood drawn and just like a little tick, you know what I mean? And yeah. there's that little blood come out. Like that's kind of like what it felt like. It, was, it wasn't gnarly. It wasn't anything. And it's amazing because it's really expensive, but it takes like, five to 10 seconds and then you're done. And like, now it's just like, we wait, you know what I mean? But I've been lucky enough that this chick, she works there and I've got, you know, I kind of got a little bit of a deal on things. And if it, you know, not if it, I'm going to keep going down and doing it. Cause like it definitely is going to work. And I hopefully like come next season, it was like the best decision I've ever made. 
like you healed faster. Is it is it expensive or what? Yeah, I mean, like one shot, one go around shot is like depends on where you get your shots, but in between six and seven grand a shot. Woo! And that's like six, like so. I paid six or no, it was. I got a special price. Yeah, yeah. But it was still like still some it's racks. A lot of money. It's yeah. There's some Dude. racks, yeah, but yeah, I like no you, joke. You, you. I got into my Achilles. And then I was starting to think, like, oh, man, my knees aren't that good. Like, what yeah, about that? And they're like, there. yeah, but, you know, it's like you you pay each, like, yeah, joint or whatever. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Uh, you're not for the session. It's for the joint. Yeah. So, I mean, Ooh. it's it's hard to, it's hard to like, want to keep going down there. But the the athlete and, like, the psych, like, the psychoticness of, like, wanting to keep going. Because, like, when I crashed, like, the last thing I was thinking is, like, I'm done or something, so. Yeah, that's the thing. If it gets you back out there and you're stoked, it's no money can really. And, like, dude, you know the deal. Like, we're skiers and snowboarders. We're not NFL players. Like, I'm sure, like, these dudes have, like, the limitless pill. They got, like, all the stuff they need. You know, they got, like, some spray. Like, the soccer guy comes out on the field and sprays his, like, ACL with and like 30 seconds later it's healed like we don't know that <laughs> we don't know that dude our companies when we get hurt they're like yo if you don't come back strong this is it yeah That's this a is good it point. so it's yeah. kind of like you know it's 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 a trip right now but I'm 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 very thankful that this person that I know like knows some of the top level athletes and like hangs around some of the top MMA fighters and like I think that these there's a lot of people doing this type of therapy and these type of injections to get themselves like the longevity and get back faster. And I hope I just stumbled into the right place. <laughs> well, I love hearing that personally. I think it's super inspiring because a lot of people see, you know, like somebody like yourself, they see you out, you know, you're doing real snow. You're still absolutely ripping. You know, you've won every single medal there is to win at the X games for, you know, however many years straight they, they see your successes, but I love kind of pulling the veil back and seeing what goes into, you know, like like there's that mentality like must be nice, right? Like must be nice to to have that. And then, but you don't see that, you know, you're going to Mexico to have some fucking hundred year old guy stab your knee, right? Like, so <laughs> I, I think it's important for um, you know, the the work that goes in behind the scenes, not just the glory, is is super important to talk about. And it seems yeah, like you've been sure, dedicated to that with your body and everything else. Right? Must be nice. If anybody like wants to say that about my life, like I don't know, <laughs> like let's put you in my shoes for a couple of the must <laughs> yeah. be nice moments and yeah. see how nice it is. You know, what I mean, <laughs> totally. That's for real. And then going back to the double, you know, just to paint a picture, you kind of came in here with this knee. Uh, it's called the the knee rover, and it's like a little scooter looking thing. And he's got he's hobbling in on one leg, the other foot's in a boot, and then and you're like, oh, I'm mobile. Whereas when you've you've done both your knees, both your ankles, you can't. Your legs are immobile. You're you know you're compa- almost paralyzed. At Fully that point. paralyzed. Yeah. At, like coming right out of surgery. Mm-hmm. I mean, when they fix your ACL and whatnot, like everything shuts down. Your quad, your hamstring, everything like shuts down, and it doesn't work for a while. Where you know you do that. To both legs, I mean, dude, just, again, like, taking a shit, you know what I mean? I never realized how many muscles you have to flex to go to the bathroom like that. And, like, my first time I did take a shit, it was like, wow. Start bawling my eyes out because, it, like, it all hit me of, like, my situation is not good right now. And that's when it's just, like, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's tough. When you're in that type of position, like, especially here in Utah, they're, they, they can be pretty friendly with, like, their pain pill prescriptions and whatnot after injuries and i mean granted i needed them but i mean through something like that just like that the, the that thought of sitting down and the first time i tried to push to get shit out and it just hit me like excruciating pain where i start like dropping tears out of my eyes and then it puts really everything into perspective of like yo i really just want to eat some pills and like forget about this you know mm-hmm. And that's an easy like, road to go down. It's a slippery slope, you know. Yeah. So, what do you do if they're gonna over over subs, subscribe? Is Pers- that prescribe. Prescribe pills. It's just got to be up to you to make that decision to be like, okay, I can't overdo it. I got to take the right amount. One hundred. That's it. It, it. it it is all up to you because like in their my mind, mom, they're just keep feeding them. Yeah. Well, family was there, and my mom, my brother, and people were there, but like, you know. You don't really hear too many people, like, going through an injury like that. You know what I mean? And so, like, when I had close ones near me, like, it, if they, like I, they could see how much pain I was in. Mm-hmm. And maybe I think through time I wasn't in that type of pain, but I kind of got used to, like, 
I can now I can fool people because like this is a terrible injury and I've like I've been eating pills for like six months because I needed them and but when you don't need them that's when it just like you realize like holy smokes I've been eating these things for way too long if you if you don't get your medicine in the morning time then like your back starts hurting mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you get like a little headache and then all of a sudden like you, you almost start like shaking and whatnot and that to go into that reality of an injury when you make it to that point that's like that deep dark hole that everybody kind of talks about but that's you haven't uncovered it yet but you found the hole but it's like covered up still you know and like that's like that's where you're either going to jump into the hole or you're going to have like you said self restraint or like that's not even self respect just self restraint to like not be like okay like I have to stop doing this but I mean Yeah, because once you cross that line, it's crossed. Prescribed heroin feels great, dude. It does. I'm not, and it's not a bad thing to say because, like, it does make people feel good. That's why people eat them a lot, right? But where, you know, as skiers and snowboarders, you know, you can't, you just can't, you can't go down that, you can't go down that road and expect to find yourself anywhere positive, you know? Especially on an injury, injury like yours that lasts nine months here. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, and I've but, always uh, been told this is the most painful injury you can do, and you're just like, oh, it's not even a big again. Deal. That's that perspective, though, yeah. man. Like, I, 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 like, out of surgery, I mean, I took a shit right away. I, I, I went to the bathroom right away. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, like, this is mellow. I'm dude. fine. I can I get around. I rovered myself right into there too, and it was like, ah, oh, this is okay. This is this is really mellow. I mean, my mom even came down for the surgery. And took off just a week later because she was even like, oh, oh this, this is, is nothing. This is like, you <laughs> got this. He's been through so much worse. 100. <laughs> so it's like my perspective again, you know, it's that Kevin Durant mentality right now where it's just like, it's not if you're going to be back. It's just like, how long do you have to wait, you know? Mm-hmm. That's, you know, it's a, a fascinating thing uh, from what you just said is I've, I did a bunch of due diligence, we'll call it, called a bunch of your friends, people you're close with uh, to kind of, do our re- do the research for this conversation, and every single person I talked to said almost the first sentence was, "Oh, Tanner's the most driven person I've ever met." And uh, that quote you just said—it's it's not if it's like you've hurt every single bone in your body, you've you know you've destroyed yourself, you just you know destroyed your Achilles again, and that that men that mindset of it's not if it's when I'm back. Where where does this is kind of a maybe a loaded question, but where do you think that drive comes from? To the just feeling know? skiing gives me, bro. That's it. Like that's all it is. There's like that, and I've been trying to figure it out for a long time. But you, you can think so hard sometimes, and sometimes like for a person like me, if I think too much, like it's bad, you know, <laughs> bad for the brain. Starts to go to the body. Then I start thinking of like weird things, and you know what I mean. So I think it's just. I found out through so many years and just like so many, like even bad breakups with girls and just everything, everything that my life has culminated to the point where I woke up one day and just realized probably a couple of years ago that like this skiing stuff is it for me. You know, this is like my escape. This is like how I, this is where I find myself. This is where I find myself most happy. Like when I say find myself, like who I really am as a person, you know what I mean? Because we all can put on a facade on your Instagram account or how you want to be portrayed through films and whatnot. But at the end of the day, dude, I'm a skier. And, like, I don't need much in life, you know. As long as I can be skiing, I know I'm going to be making conscious decisions for the to, like, better my life, to grow as a human being. Skiing really brings, like, a level of oxygen to my brain that, like, really actually makes me think in a positive direction, you know what I mean? And I realized through the old injuries, like, when you're not skiing, like, that's when, like, you know, just shit can come into your brain that doesn't need to be there, you know? And that's just from, like, being off your skis for that amount of time. When you're not trying to go out and stack a clip, like, that to me is, like, that's my life, dude. I love the whole process of just, like, thinking of something and then finding a spot and then getting a crew together and then going out, building the spot, and everything that goes into that, once you have that clip stacked, it's like, I don't know. It's hard to explain to people what that can do. You know what I mean? And so, like, that's where the drive comes from, man. And as the older I get, the more now I'm just at this point where I've, like, been through a lot of injuries, been through a lot of stuff. And I want to see, like, what my mind can really do and, like, how far I can really go. 
Because I look at dudes like Chuck Patterson, that dude who was just like skiing down like the Maverick wave. Did you see that? I didn't see that. Yeah, I guy, didn't see that. Guy he on was skis skiing on a big, a big Bro, he's wave. 48 <laughs> years old. and he's, he's got poles, too. Dude, really? He's insane. But yeah, he's he like a poles. <laughs> but that dude, Chuck Patterson, he's he's gnarly surfer. He's a gnarly surf guy, too. Like big wave surfer. And he like, he, he, he shreds with that dude, Kai Lenny, a lot. You know what I mean? And those, like guy, Kai Lenny's like a... He's like the new Laird Hamilton or in a way, just like the water god. And like to see Chuck doing what he's doing, I mean, that at 48 to just be getting towed into Mavericks, I'm looking at like, wow, I'm only 37 and like the sky's the limit. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's the feeling. It's just that feeling. And I don't think it's ever going to stop. Cause I always ask my friends that are mad older and I'm like, yo, I wonder if this is ever going to stop. Like the psychoticness of, ch- of chasing this feeling. And they're like, no, it's, it, it won't. You might go about it a little bit different when you're in your fifties, but it ain't going to change. You're going to be driving around Mexico when you're like 60 years old and you're going to see it like a triple kink. And you're going to look over and be like, damn, <laughs> dude, sure. that thing looks so nice. You're you not going to be able to stack these shots forever though. So hopefully you can, uh, don't, don't say a, that. You might prove you wrong. On that I, one. I mean, I hope so, but the body can, I mean, real snow at 60. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ski. at this point, X game should start doing the veterans real snow. <laughs> True. You know what I mean, True. yeah, well. kind of a rough year for real snow, huh? With the, the snow. Yeah, it I'm was. Sure you guys were out there finding. Where it the was. Snow was I mean, yeah, we just had to go and find it. Montana was looking like they were going to get some snow, but it just kind of tapered off. And then we, I, I just started going out to Baker because that's where the snow was for all early season. Was it similar West. to the snowboard one where you could hit street stuff or mountain stuff? And well, yeah, this year, this year, yeah, this for year, sure. The but one. the the years past, it's just been in the streets yeah. for the past years. Famous you know? snowboard, yep. yeah. And when they hit me up and asked me, I even thought about. It. I was like, yeah, I got to get back to you because, like, I don't know if I'm really down to get hurt. It's a heavy because, like, in the streets, project. that's that's like I know that the streets just hit different. And it sucks, dude, because a lot of people in our industry don't want to sponsor street kids because they're not out there wearing goggles. They're not out there wearing tech gear. They're not out there doing that. They're not like, and now like a lot of skiers ain't riding with poles in their hands. And it's hard for them to get like anything almost in our industry because like skiing, you know, it's still, it's, I mean, it's changing way for the better. Don't get me wrong, but like, it still has kind of a nerdy thing to it where it's just like. Whatever the trends are, and right now it's very trendy to, like, go ski touring. And, like, people want it, like, clothing companies want people buying the three-layer jacket because it's really expensive. When street kids are like, yo, just give me some ramen noodles and a sweatshirt and I'm good. (laughs) You know what I mean? And that, to me, is insane because these kids are going out and putting in so much work to spots and, like, literally, like, beating themselves to death, man. And, like, that... I've seen big mountain shredding and I've seen street shredding and it's a fine line to, to, to say what's gnarlier. You know what I mean? Like who's to say like you have avalanche conditions out in, you know, the mountains, but you have some things in the streets that I don't know. It's hard to even explain, man. And then you put cops on top of the whole thing. If you get four hours into building the spot and you're getting ready for your first towing and then you get kicked out. Like, those type of things, big mountain people and, like, these companies, I don't think realize, you know what I mean? And I, as years have gone, just in the past years, I have so much respect for the street scene. And, like, because I kind of got out of it for a bit. But, I mean, fuck, dude, you, there's so much room to be creative. And there's, there's the options are endless in the streets. The cops always roll up right when you're just starting, too. They just have a perfect, perfectly timed... Yeah, it was cool in Minnesota, <laughs> though, bro. We got rolled up on janitors and cops and everything. Didn't get kicked out on one spot. Where I was like, wow, city life, it's it, it just different than, than than ski towns. Yeah. Ski towns, cops don't even want to ask a question because there's no crime. There ain't nothing going on. So they're like, oh, I can do something right now. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. We're in streets. They're like, bro, we are, like, somebody just got murdered. Like, I, have fun. Yeah, have fun. You this is not I mean? a problem. Yeah. As something long as you're different. not selling drugs or hurting anyone, you're cool. Exactly. Do your thing. Okay, well, I'm going to pivot onto uh, kind of a throwback topic here on where you're from. And uh, basically, when I was doing my research, I thought you were from Park City. Found out that you're a Montana good old boy and grew up. I kind of want to paint a picture because our audience, a lot of them are snowboarders, so they maybe aren't super in touch with the ski ski scene. But it seems like you grew up skiing moguls. I was watching your gear. It was like kind of ski-esque, not that dope looking and then you like kind of got into freestyle skiing kind of pioneered freestyle and then essentially like you're you're in high school and you know you were kind of winning some freestyle contests it sounded like and then 
you eventually got some sponsors and then you smoked a spliff in front of your school and essentially dropped out or got kicked out, correct? Yeah, I got kicked out. You got but then out. I got kicked out and then I won X Games that January <laughs> and then March they like <laughs> the school's calling my mom up like, "Do you think he could come and do a photo shoot for us for the brochure and then we'll let him back half price and my mom would like, be fucking kidding me. Well, that was something so upon doing my research I found out when you when you got kicked out, you basically you had a conversation with your dad where he was like you you know you're 15 at this point 14, 15 and he's like you have 1 year you have 1 year to prove yourself on your own or else you're moving in back with us and you're fucked. And and that was the year and, and that kind of leads us into uh, a, a breakout moment. And we're, that's actually presented by Pub Beer. So we're going to pass it yeah, to Yeah, let's Buzz. get into our breakout moment presented by our friends over at Ten Barrel and Pub Beer. Pub Beer supports us. You should support them. Their tagline is cheap, fun, beer. Um, now, before skiing became a big, serious career for you, back when it was cheap and fun, do you have a memorable breakout moment? And it sounds kind of like this X Games uh, contest in high school might be it for you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that was it was it was a wild turn of events, bro. Getting kicked out of school and then mom was not stoked whatsoever. Pop was just that disappointed kind of thing. And yeah, somehow convinced pops cuz mom was like, "You're done. Like this I don't give a shit you're moving home. Like it's it's just you're done." Cuz I never really been in trouble, bro. Mm-hmm. Went from like never being in trouble to like get, being you 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 failed your second drug test and you're getting kicked out. And, like, I didn't even have to take the second drug test because, like, my teacher just saw me smoking a fucking spliff right in the parking lot. And it just at that point, though, that school I was going to was the Park City Winter School in Park City, and it was, like, very race-oriented. I didn't really have too many people on my side. And it was just kind of a weird vibe. Race-oriented as... Ski race. Ski racing. Yeah. (laughs) Just to make that clear. Ski racing is a whole (laughs) different vibe than, you know, freestyle. I mean, just like the word freestyle and racing, like you can kind of tell like where, they're opposites. how are the attitudes in both sports, you know what I mean? And so it was just a bit different. I didn't really like the school environment, but I was going to school at the water ramp, so I'm like learning all these tricks, skipping class, like lunchtime would happen, and I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to go jump. I don't really want to go to class anymore. And then my teachers would be walking over, looking at me, like shaking their heads, like, dude, what? Like, you're not going to pass your class. And it's just like, no, I just learned Switcher Audio 7. I'm going to go win X Games. Like, fuck your <laughs> class. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was, yeah, I got that happened. I knew I had all, I was sitting on all these tricks. And so I convinced Pops, and he was like, all right, dude, just do your thing. And didn't talk to my ma at all for months, actually. Talked to my dad. Like, I'd call my dad every two weeks just to check in, be like, yo, it's, I'm good. No stress. Like, I found I, I'm, I got a place to stay. I found some homies in Mammoth that are letting me stay at their house. Like you know, Rosie Rosignol is going to pay for my ticket out to the X Games because before even that though, it's just like it. It all started with I go out to Cali and X Games qualifiers at Squaw Valley. I win that, and then like right after that weekend, I go to Red Bull Huckfest at Snowbird and I won that, and that's where I got Red Bull as a sponsor at the Red Bull Huckfest. And I told my pops that, and that's where the like the tone changed from. Like, holy shit, dude. Like, you just ruined your life to, like, you got sponsored by what? You know? And I was like, yeah. It's not all negative Like, this is is good. And, like, the tone of my voice, my dad's voice changed. Still not talking to my mom. And then I go to the U.S. Open right after that, and I won uh, Big Air, and I got third in slope style. And right from there, that's when my pops was like, no way, dude. And I was like, yeah, X Games is next weekend, pop. So I'm about to fuck this up. And I went there, and I won that. And, like, right when I won that, that's where my mom, like, right when they announced me the winner, my mom comes, walk, like, walking up to me, and she's bawling her eyes out, and she just puts her arms out, and that was, like, the breakout moment for me. Wow. I mean, like, having having such – that, like, ruined my parents, I'm not going to lie, to, like, get kicked out of school. And that's still, like, their main thing they want me to do is probably finish, you know. And I've just got – At I your got, age now? Well, yeah, I mean, they like want that's you to go get your GED. One hundred, and I got all the GED testing books up at my spot right Sick, now, and dude. that's going to be my goal for this summer is that's to knock badass. that out. And that's not for really anything, but my parents to be like, "Yo, thank you guys did everything you could to get me to where I am now." I'm so gonna I, give them an air horn yeah. for that. How old were you at this when you were doing all these contests? Well, this breakout year I was seventeen, so I so got kicked out of school. You were at 16. underage, yeah. You were underage, yeah. and your parents gave you enough uh, rope to go out and do this yeah. to see if you're gonna 
yeah. make it or not make it. Shout out to it. those supportive parents, always, yeah. dude. Yeah. So dope. Big yeah, up, Jar- Darla and Jerry. Like, I got the best parents that <laughs> Especially really, like. when you're not under their roof, you know? Like 100. I couldn't believe they actually, like, let me, get, like, come down to Utah without their supervision and, like, start living freestyle ski life, you know? And, like, yeah. I it, it, I could have probably had some better mentors around me when I was super young. But you live and you learn, you know what I mean? And I've always been good that every time I screw up, I know how to fix it, like, exponentially. We all know right and wrong. We all mm-hmm. have conscious in our brains. We all know, like, when you're about to do some shady shit, you know. And you have your voice <laughs> screaming at voice. you. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> so thank God, like, I know the difference between the good voice and the bad voice. You know what I mean? And, yeah, that's that. that was just, that was the biggest thing that I knew for myself that I just need to finish. I just need to finish school for my parents because I know it's not for me. It's not for anything. And it's like my parents have done, uh, have gone above and beyond. And they still do to this day, which is like, I'm very blessed, man. Because I know some of my buddies that grew up in the ski world that don't have supportive parents and they're not in the same position, you know. Well, I, that uh, I want to run it back to kind of some of the stuff we were just talking about because you won everything that year, it sounds like, for the most part. And then continue to go on basically a 10 year run of winning everything in skiing. There's almost just too many medals to list, honestly. So, what I wonder is you take a, you know, 17 year old kid, you pay him a ton of money. He's from a small town in Montana. Like, were you ready for that fame and that money at that age? No, not even close. Not even close. And you can go back and look, bro. Like, I got. There, like, there's many stages to Tanner Hall and throughout the ski industry. It's crazy. And, like, the cockiness and, you know, from cockiness to depression and everything in between, in between, you know, to coming out the other side, like, with a sense of accomplishment, but, but a sense of, like, I know what to do now, and I know, like, my path in a way. Where young guy from Kalispell... Then all of a sudden, I went from no money to, like, buying a condo in Mammoth. Like, just it, at 17. It was insane. I had to have my dad come down and at sign 17. for it. 17. I, was, I wasn't old enough. Like, you can't be buying condos in real yeah. estate when you're under 18. So I had to have my dad come down and sign for my first condo. And it was crazy because it was right when they were going to start building the village at Mammoth. Or they had just proposed it. And I had bought the condo in, like, August. And then I had sold it. In, I think that next April, and I didn't even own it for a year. I think I owned it for eight months, and I, like, I made 150 you grand caught on that it. that market right, huh? Caught it right. And I looked at my pops. I was like, why don't we just do this all the time? What gave you <laughs> the wherewithal like, you know, at 17 to actually buy a condo and not just blow your money? Ah, uh, pops. So he was kind of telling yeah, me, my like, dad was the, the one, money, let's do this. 100. 100, man, because, like, all the checks that I won, all the big checks that I won, like, Yo, I had an IRA and a, and a life insurance policy by the time I was 18 years old. You know what I mean? And your dad told you to do that as well? Props. One thing uh, our listeners are fascinated with, and myself at times and too, myself. Uh, is cheddar biscuits, which is kind of how much money is earned in certain time periods. And I, I kind of wonder, in that year when you were 17, do you know... Do you have a gauge on fiscal earnings for the year or well on rough? contest winnings alone it was over a hundred grand, probably like a yeah. hundred and ten. Yeah. At seventeen. Yeah. And then plus Red Bull. Yeah, Red Bull signed me. But it was crazy because like I had that first good year, Red Bull signed me and and I was on Oakley at the time, but I wasn't like I was pretty I was pretty ignorant to the fact of like what like what your self worth is worth. Yeah, you're I was so like, young. no, I'm just gonna go win contests and this is how you make your money. Until I kind of realized, like, I was skiing around some kids that were making, like, healthy salaries on like, contract. And I'm here. like, wait a second here. How the <laughs> fuck am I getting $1,500 a month? Or, I mean, not even a month. $1,500 a year. But then your contest winnings go, you know, is into triple digits. I was like, Yo, I mean, six digits. I'm like, this, something's not right here. You know what I mean? So, after the second year I won X Games, that's when shit really got bananas. It got really bananas. I mean, I remember... Down the road, like, the last Red Bull contract I signed was, like, a four-year deal for 200 grand a year. And that was 
that was pretty heavy. And 200 like, grand a year, is that yeah. you said? Woo. And that's just the energy drink. Yep, that was just the energy drink. And Oakley was definitely taking care of me. It's not like this anymore. And, yeah. and they, like match your, not. they match your winnings, correct? They didn't match my winnings oh, because did. I actually, like, went ham on the salary. I was like, <laughs> I don't want this yeah, incentive like, of, like, me up front. if I do good, then you'll throw me a cookie. It's like, no, nah, <laughs> no, no. Smart. Did I you have an agent? Helping yep, you? I nice. did. I did. Yeah, I got an agent. Her name was Nadia Guerrero, and that was my first one. And I was with her for many years. And then when she kind of like was just drifting out of the agency, I met this dude Tom Yaps. And yeah, but I think agents are like a agents are something that's very necessary because it's just like my pops was very necessary to like control the amount of monetary that was coming in. But an agent was very necessary for knowing your self worth and being able to go after like what he thinks that you are worth. Because it sucks putting a price, your own price tag on yourself and then calling people up and saying, like, no, this is what I deserve. Yeah. Because, like, those, some of the, some, I've learned some of those conversations that the agents have with these companies, they're not fun. Yeah, they're hard. They're not fun. And so if you have to do it yourself, it can kind of debilitate you on almost like, oh, man, maybe I'm, maybe I think I'm worth way more than I am and maybe I got to chill and maybe I this and maybe I'm that. Because this is a confidence game. And if you're going to try to do that, just know that your confidence can go down just in that little thing alone. So when you get back on your skis. It can affect your skiing. Exactly. Wow. So agents, I always feel like if you are wondering if an agent is good or bad for you in this industry, it's very good. And people are shysty, bro. Like companies don't want to pay you what you're yeah, worth. They're going to do job everything to pay they you can. As little as exactly. They can, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that budget slim. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let's pivot into another topic that is uh, is kind of interesting to myself. <laughs> and you know, we're snowboarders, and you you come from the ski world. Now, what would you say the difference is between ski and snowboard culture? Oof, You've I, always seen kind of attached to snowboard culture. Yeah. To well, a I mean, I've took out so much influence, bro. Like, I mean, when I started getting into this stuff, it was like the year of Mark, like Marco and. You know, even Andrew Crawford. I grew up with Crawford up in Big Mountain, up in Whitefish Resort. And it's ah. like, I got to see that dude, like, from many stages. And, like, that's where it kind of, like, hit me. I was always wondering, like, oh, the fuck are skiers, like, just hitting moguls and doing spread eagles and stuff? Like, this dude's hitting cat, cat tracks. He's doing half cabs off a of summer house cliff. He's He's got big-ass clothes on. He looks, like, really cool. He's got cool friends. You know what I mean? Like, what? what is really going on here? So I think like for me at a young age, just having like a pro, it wasn't just Andrew. I think Travis Parker was like growing up at big mountain as well, where I'm like, damn dude, between Andrew Crawford and Travis Parker, those are two insane dudes to be able to like, this is who I could watch. And I grew up with Jason Robinson. Like we're the same age. And I remember like him and Dylan Candelari just every day, like those, it was just very easy to take an influence from snowboarding and at the, at, at where I grew up, you know what I mean? And so, I'd say the biggest difference is just the level of, I don't know, just, just like mo- w- w- there's money in skiing. There's a lot of money in skiing, right? And with money kind of comes a country club type effect. Like I always say like skiing in the U S right now, it's, it's turning into like the new golf. It's it, like, it, you have to have money. I mean, Jesus Christ, do Vail resort, Vail resort. I'm a, I'll, I'll talk shit, dude. Cause I don't really like that place. I think it's flat. I don't like Starbucks all over the place. I don't like, they're like heated sidewalks at ski with like, it's like, no, nah, it's, it's snow. Like why? It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. And to charge $210 for a lift ticket, it's like, yo, beat it. That's like that, that turns people away. That makes people look at skiing and just being like, oh, that's that rich shit. Like, I don't like, I don't even want to think about that. You know what I mean? Where I hope at some point we can figure that out because you go over to Europe and I mean like, dude, like season pass at Chamonix is like, you know. It's not even a thousand euro. And to me, I'm sitting there like, how are these places charging this much money? Why do they want like Starbucks and creperies all over the place? Why? And that, and to tell you the truth, when you have that type of stuff, it attracts like, like Jerry of the day. Like it's literally like Jerry of the day. (laughs) Jerry of the day magnets. Yeah. 100%. And rich people, like they don't really have to learn the culture. They can have everything given to them. Yeah, so can, it's like a level of ignorance slice. that just comes in. And you see it at Park City all the time during Christmas. I'll be looking at some guy with his whole family walking to the chairlift. He's got like six pairs of skis. His wife's just on her phone, just laced in like designer gear. The kids are like 
just fighting with each other. And the look on this man's face, he's like in rear entry fucking rental ski boots. <laughs> Where I'm looking at him, I'm like, yo, really? Like, how much money are you spending right now, dog? Because, like, you look like you want to be on a beach right now. Yeah, right. And it's like those people are getting in the way. Those people, like, don't really know. Like, it sucks that we're so ingrained in what we do that skiing is this type of sport that it can just attract just ignorance, I feel like. Because, I mean, you see it this year with the COVID and stuff with, like, a lot of resorts, like, having, you know, a lottery to go up there. Now it's pushing people into the backcountry. And, I mean, look at it, dude. Some guy just died here in the Wasatch with no beacon on. Really? Mm -hmm. I didn't like, see that. Like, that, that to me is, like, that's a, that's that's... That's insane. No beacon, huh? No beacon, and he was there with his girlfriend, and his girlfriend just had to, like, watch him go Jesus. get swallowed up, and that was it. Do you know where they were? Somewhere up in the Wasatch. I wonder if she had the snowmobile in or hike in. Uh, or... Yes. That's, that's it was. Just, I think it was just right off a chairlift or something. Oh. Up snow. Like, yeah, it was. Got like, into the back country. Yeah, because my physical therapist, her husband flies the chopper, like, the, 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 Safety the chopper. KSL chopper. Mm. Like, it's chopper five for the news. And so I remember, like, she called me up and just was like, you don't have anybody skiing out there today. And I was like, nope. And so when I turned on the news, they actually, it was crazy because he get, he flies out there and, like, he starts filming the people probe striking and he actually caught the probe strike. And that's lucky, wow. lucky, lucky that, because they can't be taking out their beacons. Homie mm -hmm. doesn't even have a beacon on. Yeah. And the girlfriend's like, ah, a beacon? Yeah, what's Wah. a beacon? Yeah, that's you know, horrific. deer in the headlights. And so she's like, uh, and she probably was like, ah, oh, we have the reco. Yeah, yeah, it's like, Jesus. oh, the body recovery device. That's great. Like, yeah. you have no idea what you're doing out here, and that's a problem, you know what I mean? Because if people are going to start going out there, like, ski resorts are one thing. You start sending those type of people out into the mountains, and it's just a level of ignorance. And I think that's what it is with ski and snowboard culture, where snowboarding, it seems like the people that get into it have a level of, a different level of maybe smart inside, or like, uh, not I even smart, common that. sense, yeah. maybe. Common sense, not even smart. I, oh, I want to interject for a second, because I think there's there's idiots on snowboards, there's idiots on skis. But uh, kind of to change gears on the culture subject, I was listening to you talk, and I know that you've been super controversial over the years in skiing, right? Like openly smoke weed, and going back to some of the things about skiing, there's there's definitely some people in the culture that maybe aren't okay with that. Maybe let's... let's uh, assume some of the country club type of mentality that's all oh, we that's that's not okay whereas snowboarding we had sean palmer to pave the way and smoke weed and and fuck off and be punks and it seemed like up until you're maybe i don't know if about skiing but up until you came through you were one of the first like leaders of the sport the maybe the leader of the sport and to be openly smoking weed it it seemed like the two cultures were different in that way whereas snowboarding is like oh no big deal Right. I don't know. Just an interesting. Yeah, no, that you hit it right there. And it's that's where I'm saying it's that level. It's like mm -hmm. the type of stuff that these ski resorts and like these ticket prices and everything. I feel like they attract a different type of thing where when snowboarding came out, you guys were like, the you know, you, you hated one. You know, you're like the, the punk rockers and this and that. And that that alone, when it kind of stepped on the scene, like you've seen the video like from here. Oh, yeah. And they're like, how many fucking like how many videos have they put out going in the parking lot at Alta asking like, yeah. should we let snowboarders here? Yeah. And like you get it real quick. Like, holy smokes. Like people actually really think like that. That's mm -hmm. kind of gnarly. Yeah. Forget that sometimes too. And I think it's just the level of status I think skiing brings in compared to the level of status that snowboarding would bring in. But it's changing, dude. I mean, fuck. Now I see like drake and travis scott and all these people like oh, i'm enjoying a day of snowboarding and it's like well sick dude at least you're getting in the mountains yeah i saw travis scott out there getting it um yeah let's let's talk about some of the other skiing things uh i, I was i was wondering because we're unfamiliar one thing um the pole situation i kind of want to get a hot take what's the what's the vibe with pole versus no pole as to some people that are un unfamiliar with that. I used to be a hater on no poles. Really? Yeah, I used to hate on it all the time, and now I'm, like, skiing more without poles. What about poles with, in with the poles. pipe, though? I They don't serve a purpose whatsoever. The half pipe? Yeah, because some guys use them, some don't. I mean, poles do bring a level of balance. They do. Yeah. When, I'm, when I have but poles... But when you go to grab, you got this pole in your hand and the... Poles don't really fuck with your grabs, they I don't, don't think, no. And it's just like when you have something in your hands and you grew up skiing like that, there is a level of balance. Like it's like you're, you're holding on to it. something. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, totally. A balance. You got a little more leverage in certain yeah, ways for balance. Exactly. Yeah. But now, I mean, the new wave, like these new generation kids, like they, they want get, no they poles. Get, yeah, they get so nice without the poles. And it's 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 insane because for me on rails and stuff, like I'm way better at sliding rails with poles because I feel like 
it's all balance, Back right? To balance. And like I have like a certain amount of weight, whether they're only a couple of ounces in my hands and I'm like grabbing onto something. Yeah. It can like help with my balance where you know, I feel like my skiing and like the progression of it, like I don't have poles in my hands, like the more I'm trying because I realize it's harder for me. And I mean, if I can master that, then it's like, I'm getting better at 37 and it's like, okay, I can, I'm not going to, I, you know, it's just the teacher becomes the student on that type of thing. <laughs> I used to hate on no poles. You know what I mean? But now and you're chill. Now I'm all good. And the kids are, a lot of them aren't using poles then. I mean, there's, 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 yeah. I mean, there's a lot of kids that don't. And, but like the really special ones that I like to watch, I mean, Henrik Carlo, he's been using poles a lot more lately but somebody like Phil Casabone, I don't think we'll ever use poles again. And it's just like those type of how those two kids ski. It's like it's undeniable. You know what I mean? And Henrik's just as good with poles and without. Henrik's fucking dude. That guy is. Easy yeah. to I think. No offense, but I think he's my favorite skier. Oh, for sure, he's my he's, favorite. Yeah, I think he's, he's everybody's been my favorite skier. <laughs> he's everybody's right now, dude. That kid is so nasty, dude. And talk about like a like a focus. You know what I mean? That kid has the strongest focus and like. It's really insane to me because he's the first dude, like, in our crew that, like, would go out and do Nosebud Trip 16 for fun. Oh, and that came like on Bud? Just for fun. Yeah. Nosebud? Nosebud Trip 16. Like, oh, a butter, butter. Uh, like you butter, like you see yeah. them did back yeah, in the day, yeah. but, like, we even later off, uh, off the takeoff. I've seen that. I didn't know, it was, but I didn't know Bud was butter. I yeah, like nose that, bud. Nose butter. <laughs> I like that. You know, the nose butter. <laughs> yeah, but that kid, I don't know, like, he, when, when, when he started getting real good, and there's one X Games where I was all fucked up. It was, like, right before I stopped drinking. But he hadn't thrown the nose butter trip 16, and I was watching him. It was the first year, like, you kind of had to come with two tricks, just two different tricks. They weren't even making you spin both ways yet. It was just you had to have two different tricks. So everybody came, and everybody was doing two tricks. That's it. They would just rotate from one, and then they'd go to the other. One, the other. At, right, like, Henrik's ninth jump in finals. He did, he had, he had, it was his ninth different trick. And that's when I was like, holy shit, I see what, like, history's happening right now. So I got a, snowmo that, I got a snowmobile up to the top, and I just grabbed him, and I was like, you know what time it is, G? Like, you got to do that nosebud trip. And he's like, first thing he says, he's like, yo, it'd be so ill to win without it, though. And I look at him, I was like, yeah, but you know you got that shit. And he's just standing there, like, super focused. Then he looks right over at me, and he cracks a smile, and he goes, I know. And then just looks forward again. That's where I got goosebumps. I was like, holy fuck, dude, this kid's like, like, I got goosebumps right now just thinking about <laughs> that. Because it's like that, th there's some people where you can tell something's about to happen. And, like, there's a confidence that some, like, certain people can, like, exude, exude without yeah. even trying. <laughs> and just that little, like, holding on to his skis that he was when I was like, yo, it's knows about trip time. It'd be so ill to win without it, though. And I was like, bro, but you know you got that shit to see that look. And just the biggest smile and just that, I know. And then look forward again. I was like, it's on. Here we go. And to watch him drop in and lace that first try ever, like in finals, the last jump of X Games, like that's some hero shit. Bro. Damn. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's like, he's been, he's a big reason why I'm still in it, you know? Because through that last, like my broken legs and whatnot, I was in some deep, dark places. And like, he came to my side and was like, dude, you, you, like, you can't be done. And, like, I take a lot for that. I give him, like, all the respect in the world for that because, like, you need people like that in your corner. You know yeah, that's I mean? awesome. Yeah. It's major. Especially since you'd been hurt a couple times, too, with, with both legs being immobilized. I Yo. Mean, that's got to put you in a dark place. For real. And it's just, like, how, how our whole culture growing up, just with the hip-hop music and reggae music and smoking weed and whatnot, like, Henrik really grabbed a hold of that culture, you know. But he's Swedish, dude. And Swedish people are, like, the smartest, most on point. They don't, they're not addicts. They're not... It, like they're driven they're everything you know so i think he just took like what me and a couple of my homies did and just like learned from our mistakes and then it's just been fully running with it and like that's the reason why he is the best of the best right now that's cool it, the thing you two both have in common it seems like you both genuinely love skiing and i think you can see that in people's you can you can see when there's there's a rider out there or a skier then they're like they're maybe holding on and doing it for a check and you can it shows in their riding but the people that authentically love it it shows through in a lot of ways yeah what a lot a lot of people know about henrik is that his dad owns one of the biggest champagne and wine distribution companies in the world so he's he money and henrik he, uh, it's never going to be a problem but he still has that drive you'll never huh? notice it though bro he yeah. like doesn't even like sometimes he doesn't like even shower and like change clothes because he's in the zone so hard and he's killing it so hard where like 
simple things down to hygiene like can go to the wayside because like he really? loves it that much. <laughs> He's just and so that's focused. not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm like I'll find myself in those kind of positions, but like to have Henrik and to know his background and like. A lot of, like, he could be supporting crazy whips. He could be rocking crazy jewelry. He could be rocking designer handbags every day. He could be rocking the craziest clothes. He could be living the most lavish lifestyle. That dude, like, goes to Rick's Granson and camps in a tent for over 60 days just to get a segment built. And you're like, holy smokes, dude. Like, the love is, like, pure right there. Yeah, he really loves it. (laughs) That's awesome. You know what, though? That's When I talked to everybody, they said the same shit about you. They're like, that dude loves skiing. It's it, so much. and it's just that feeling. We'll go back to, like, the dri- what drives you. It's like there ain't no better feeling, bro, in my mind. There ain't no better feeling, especially when you can control the feeling on, like, how intense the feeling can get or how relaxed it can be. Like, when you're in full control of, like, your emotions, it's 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 something that you can't even explain. I want to bookmark something that you said earlier, and it's important, I think, for our listeners and myself and everybody to hear but, you know, you said, if I think too much, like, I don't know exactly where you worded it, but it's not good, essentially. And it's good to know that, you know, people that are, you know, that idolize you, look up to you. You got a crazy rat trap between your ears. I got a crazy rat trap between my ears. We're all fucking crazy. We just got to, you know, for skiing and snowboarding, it's the one thing that can kind of fix a lot of problems. I'll be so stressed out and then be like, oh, I'll go spin a couple laps, and then boom, I'm back in the fucking, everything makes sense again. And it's, I don't know, it's just interesting how uh, it's a form of meditation or however you want to put it. But And it really is. And, like, you know, this might be getting ahead of myself, but hopefully, like, a dude like Nicholas can find that meditation because right now, dude, I, to think that we're not going to see Mueller in, like, another film of absence or yeah, there's no real, like, distinct what's gonna happen like because dude to me and his his writing to me like fuck dude him and gigi has played like a huge part in like how i view the mountain and like what i want to get out of it and it just sucks like i hope you know in a situation like what's happened in this past summer and just like since may i hope I just hope, like, he can, I just hope I can watch Nicholas still moving. I'm sure he's still going to shred, though, right? Well, I, I, I yeah. don't know. All I've been hearing is, you know, some different stuff, and I, you, you know he's always going to shred, but yeah. to be able to, like, be hyped on a project and, like, have ideas still swirling in your brain and be like, yo, okay, let's go get this stuff, like, out of my brain and on film. Yeah, true. To put out to the world to show, like, not only am I still good, like, I'm better than a lot of people. Because the way that dude flows down a mountain is like, you know. Yeah, it's unmatched by a lot of others, oh that's God, for sure. Dude, it's crazy. True yeah, story. Interesting stuff. Maybe I that, got a, yeah, go ahead. a Patreon question I want to ask. That's kind of just since we're talking about skiing and snowboarding. This is from uh, John Schofield. He asks, um, how do you feel about skiing with snowboarders? And what would you say to ski-only resorts like Alta that won't let you ski there with your snowboarding homies? Well, I think... Skiing with snowboarders is, like, an essential part for me and, like, my style. And, like, I got so many friends that are snowboarders that it's just, like, it. at this point, you don't even think about, like, who you're going to go with. It's, like, it's not skiers or snowboarders. They're, they're just my friends. You know what I mean? It's That's like, awesome. Yeah. Well said. It's not two two boards or one stick. You We all smile the same. And, like, yeah. that's just the deal. But what I would say, Alta's a tough one, <laughs> you know. I, I bought my first pass at Alta last year. And, uh. Dude, Alta is really sick, and I it, it's it, it does suck that snowboarders aren't allowed. I'm I'm sorry for you guys, because <laughs> I mean we're missing out or what? Yeah, what right? are we missing out on? We yeah. don't know. I never we don't even know that wildcat chairlift, bro. It's like yo, it's 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 really sick. It's like a natural terrain park, pretty much. Is it like the best around or what? And we don't even know about it. You're gonna say yeah, it's that good. It sucks, dude. It it really does because Alta is just like it is that good. It really is. It really is. And it sucks that that that's the mentality, but at least Alta is better than somebody like Deer Valley, you know? At least at Alta, when you park your car, you don't have people running out asking if they can put your ski boots on for you. Yeah, if they true. Can, you know, carry your shit into the lodge or something. Like, that's that type of, that's that, like, the culture of skiing compared to snowboarding. Like, Deer Valley is a really crazy culture. I mean, they hand around, they, they, they got people that they hire to give away coffees and cookies in the every lift line. Which is dope. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, that's that's. So kind we're of missing out on that. But it's some pampered life. Up it's there. pampered life, yeah. dude. Especially when they come at you and they're like, "Yo, you need help putting your ski boots on." You look at them like, 
You should just say yes. <laughs> it's hard for seasons. me to say <laughs> yes, though, because yeah. that shit is so goofy where I'm like, yeah. bro, this is what you do. Like, you get paid for this. Yeah, this you get is paid bananas. to put on people's ski, rich people's ski boots. <laughs> that is straight bananas. But, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's hard for me to say anything about Alta because, like, it's it's really a sick mountain, and they, like, cater really well to skiers, and they're really they're really righteous people. It's just I, I, I don't like the I don't like the mentality of, like, not letting only just skiers at a resort. Cause Especially in a year when it's all about inclusion and they're still just not changing anything, you know? I know. I know. You know what? Though? I, I'm gonna, I got a take on this. If the lift's that good, though, man. Maybe we should start fighting more to try to get up there. It's true, but, like, at the end of the day, we're, like, we're snowboarding. It's, it's the fucking... We're already skiing and snowboarding is already... We don't have a lot of problems. It's not like we have generally... The majority of people that do it are white. It's not like there's, like, too many things that are, like fucking holding us back and so it's like oh, so we, we can't ride a resort yeah who gives a shit like i think the fun skier snowboarder shit talking banter of like skiing versus snowboarding it's it's great it's like it's good to have some of that stuff and and fucking you know lightheartedly talk shit and and who can you know like if that's our biggest problem it's not that big of a fucking problem that's what i'm getting no at. yeah and the banter needs to be there especially yeah. in cancel culture bro like yeah. i'm like, yeah, the more it goes on, the more it gets a little bit ridiculous. And yeah. just, like, I just want, when we're all on, on the hill and we're doing our thing, not to have to, like, bite my tongue and, like, not to have to watch what you say and whatnot. And, like, there should be, like, you should be able to give your buddy shit. Yeah, you know, and Yeah. Like, on a, on a, to an extent, you yeah. know, you don't want to go out there and just be, like, straight be a jerk yeah, to just him. Just to be a dick to <laughs> everybody. But, like, I mean... Yeah, like, skiing and snowboarding have had a riff for a little while, and, like, it's getting way, way better, but it is it is fun to keep, yeah. you yeah. know, a little bit of, you know... But I feel like in my youth, it was when pretty it can, heavy. Yeah, there was heavy shit talking when I was young, and now you'll Fuck, meet kids dude. that do both, and it's cool, you know? Bro, I remember being, like, 17 and being in the lift line at Mammoth and, like, actually, like, having snowboards being like, fuck, punch you, punch you. Yeah, like, Cause like I just like, fight. I would cut somebody <laughs> off and, like, not even realize it, trying to get into the line at, on the park chair at the Mammoth, because, you know, where the, the slow signs come, everybody's fucking going yeah. that which way. Yeah, and it got, it, it was intense. People like, wanted right, to fight. Like, one, straight fight and i'm just sitting here like yo bro i'm not even like i just hit puberty i'm like going through it. i'm so small i'm not trying little. to fight like, here yeah, word up you're huge are you you will kick the shit out of me yeah you like, win for sorry i like went in front of you without seeing it you know what i mean yeah but to see where it is now it's fucking dope because like i'm on the free ride world tour hanging out with like victor de la rue and gigi rough like on the regular and it's like there is nothing there it's just like we're shredders. That's cool. Yeah, at a certain point of maturity, that's what happens. But I think when you're a kid, you have this stupid fucking Yeah, it's fun. Thing. <laughs> One thing you don't realize is skiers, I've been touring lately. First time using poles in my life. Dude, I love it. I'm loving the poles, dude. You got the. You guys can do the clap where you clink them together. That's dope. You can point at all the shit on the mountain. Oh, <laughs> oh we got a Sunshine Peak over there and uh, pointing at shit with poles. Is sick. Dude, the clank is like <laughs> actually like legit when you're about ready to drop and you got that. All right, filmers ready and you get that count in and like right before you like I'll always just go one, two and like that's a like, couple of clinks. It's like a, it's like here we just go. As you're once dropping you, in. Yeah. And once you feel like that second pole clink, that's it's, like it's engage dude it's a it's weird i've never really thought about that but the pole clink together like that's that's some shit when you see somebody about ready to get a like on a film shoot or something and you see those two poles clink together and drop in get ready it's something because that down. dude has that feeling and it brings a crazy feeling where you know yeah like you guys don't have that and also testing the snowpack you whack the snow you exactly whack the cornice you know you look way more extreme like doing <laughs> that than just trying to look over it you know <laughs> <laughs> and it's another sponsor for yeah. you guys oh, to get yeah. more money. Is there different brands for Yeah, poles? there's got to be different brands or no. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's get into uh, name that video part. What do you think? Oh, snap. Do I got to put on the headphones? Yep. Yes. Now, name that video part is presented by the Dew Tour. Unfortunately, their winter event has been canceled, but it sounds like the skate event is going to happen so stay tuned for that. They support us. You guys should support them. Now let's get into name that video part. Um, what's your confidence level, Tanner? Uh, zero through ten. On naming video parts? Yes. Name. Oof. I mean, I I well, select this riders. Is, this is actually snowboarding too. It's yeah. snowboarding <laughs> with some select riders. I'm very confident, but I mean, there's a lot of riders out there and a lot of movies that <laughs> yeah. I haven't even seen. So let's see how this goes. Okay, let's see how it goes. Here we go. God, dude. 
I know this one too, I feel like. It has something to do with the neck gaiter you're wearing. Uh, is it Lucas Magoon? That is correct. Yeah. I was going to say either Lucas Magoon or who was that? It was some Tech 9 movie I felt like it had it, but maybe it was. Yeah, I don't know. What so movie that, was that? That, that was Lucas, was Lucas in? Magoon in Rutland. Yes, Rutland, and, and the if, GBP. That's how I dude, know that. That's yeah. like what I first started watching when I linked up with the Gremlins. So, uh, you first of all, you won yourself. A little prize pack. We got a bomb Woo. hole cooler filled with bomb hole merch. Oh, we got the mug. He's got the. I think we got some new sunglasses Shoot, in there. This stickers. Is like, this is the flyest shit I've ever won, bro. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's <laughs> put it right next to your X Games gold. It's kind of of the same caliber. <laughs> For real. <laughs> and uh, dude, I mean the culture behind this one's a little bit deeper than the X Games. <laughs> Appreciate that. How'd you that. get that neck gator? Lucas sent that to you, or? Well, yeah. Um, I. I've been rocking goon gear for a little bit of time now. And I mean, I've been a big supporter of Lucas Magoon. I feel like how he got did in the industry was a little bit dirty. And then to see him like turn it all around in such, such a positive direction, man. Cause like to see where he like was before he got hurt to see where he is now, mm -hmm. like the transformation is real. Yeah. And, and quitting it's drinking like, and it's just amazing, bro. Yeah. Cause like the, he's a type of dude. I feel like our culture needs. Yes. You know Absolutely. I mean? He's we, one of those personalities. Yeah. And so after a couple years of rocking the gear, uh, him and Tanya hit me up, uh, last summer and was like, yo, we'd like to do a collab piece. And they put me in touch with, uh, Dave Doman Sick. and Dave actually did up my goon gear piece. They run, they only did a limited line. And it sold out like right away. Actually, what was on your piece? I don't think I. I don't even know. If it was. I saw that. It was just like their normal windbreaker, and it just said goon gear like that. But on the back, it was uh, a my face half lion. It was like really? half of a lion and a spliff coming out of its mouth, and then half of it was my face, and that then like the insane. hair was like all smoke and weed leaves and shit. It was fucking. That's and Doman cool. made that. Yeah, Doman. Hell yeah, Doman's the man. Check that out. That's Doman awesome. is the man, and it was sick to be in contact with that <laughs> fool and actually like, you know. Have go through have, the process. Go through the process yeah. with him, you know. And yeah, bro, when I saw that Simon, you know, passed away recently, like that really, yeah, kind of like made me think about like everybody, you know, especially Doman, because I know only times I ever kicked it was with with Simon was over at like in the garage and stuff. But Doman seemed like he was there every day. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He lived there. Yeah, yeah he yeah. was doing his art. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, rest in peace, Simon. Rest in peace, Simon. But, yeah. yo, big up Dave and big up Lucas. And, yeah, like just, yeah, I'm real proud of Lucas and how he stepped up in the manhood and just the fatherhood. And Yeah, he's killing it as a he's dad. Just, he's, he's killing it really on all specs of life, you know. And I hope, I just hope that, you know, we start seeing, like we have, he's starting to get it back a little bit. And I just, like, I'm really excited to know that the Goon Gear's trying to make a movie this year. So hopefully he's just getting clipped up, like, yeah. behind the scenes right now. And then all of a sudden, come next fall, we're like, holy shit, he's back. Mm -hmm. He's back. Yeah. Well, uh, if you guys haven't watched that Lucas Magoon in Rutland part, do me a favor. As you're going, about to go snowboarding or skiing, put that thing on. He's, like, running shit over with a Ford Bronco. <laughs> he's, like, riding dirt bikes. He's just reckless. He's killing it. One of the best goon parts of all time. And uh, that brings us to part two of Name That Video Part for our vi listeners and viewers. Here we go. Oh, dog. See, that's yeah, a hit. That for sure. But on tunes like that, like, yeah, I'm going to have to say, I don't know if I know that one. Yeah, that's, that's all good. That's for our, <laughs> for our listeners anyway. We make it hard for them because they. Uh, They'll figure it They'll out. They'll figure it out. Okay. So, yeah, that one's for, for them. That's not for me. That one's not for you. Yeah, that yeah. one's not Sick. for you. So it worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you already won, dog. Yo. <laughs> yeah, you won. Nice. <laughs> okay, I think we should get into some hot takes. Now, a uh, common one we ask on the show is the Michael Jordan of snowboarding. Who you got? Michael Jordan of snowboarding? Travis Rice? Good answer. Michael Jordan of skiing. Michael Jordan of skiing. Henry Carlo. Worst trend in skiing or snowboarding. Worst trend in skiing or snowboarding. Going back, size medium. <laughs> Sh 
<laughs> medium. Yeah, kids being confused on what size of clothes to wear. <laughs> and okay. all, bigger is always better. Like, just if you're wondering, stick figures, tight, skinny jeans, like you can see every flaw. True. Big clothes, you can hide some flaws. And it goes real good to certain music. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, so in snowboarding, one we talk about a lot of times is the beaver slap when you're in the lift line and you and you slap your board. But uh, I wanted to know your take on what we call the harpoon, the skis over the shoulder, walking around. Yeah, it's 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 I do it. Yeah, you do it. It's a thing. Yeah, Everybody sometimes. Does it. Yeah, you know what I mean. You ever it's taken any, like, you ever taken anybody's head head off with that thing? Oh, fully, <laughs> <laughs> fully. But those are the type of people that shouldn't be standing there. It's just the easiest way to carry skis. It, or they what? got a lot of things. It's four things. I think more. It's, one like, thing. it's mainly for like. When I'm, like, done putting on all my gear and I grab my skis, I'm walking to the chairlift. Yeah. Like, I usually, like, if I'm hiking pipe or I'm hiking a jump or something, I'm always, like, right by my side, like, right here. Yeah. Or even if I'm, my arms are tired, I'll put it behind my back like that. Yep. Kind of like how people carry snowboards behind the back. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it's more of an end-of-the-day thing. Or in the morning, I guess. Dude, they just got a lot of yeah. shit. They got a lot of shit to carry. A lot of stuff man. to carry. We do, of... dude. There's a lot right, of moving we got parts one. to skiing. It's we got one boots up. are heavy. Oh, my God. They're torture chambers. How come they haven't figured out a better boot yet? I don't know. It's insane. I guess it's because the boot and the binding are all in one. It's just like everybody's so quick to say, listen to the science. And it's just like, can we send some of that to ski boots? Because yeah. like, they've got to change <laughs> at some point, dude. This is ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to pivot into a s- another subject. Pivot is a word we like to beat to death on the show. Um, and that would be your four years off the booze. Now, what led to that? What were the events that led up to that? Well, uh, I mean, a lot of events led to it, dude. I was just not good at drinking. Drinking made me a complete different person. It made me say things I would never say. It made me do things I'd never do, make decisions I'd never make. Had me finding myself at an ATM pulling $300 out at like 4 in the morning for nothing positive whatsoever. And the amount of times that happened was amazing. And then in, you know, and then March 13th or March 12th, no, it was March 13th. Yeah, March 13th, uh, 2017, I got a DUI in the Squaw Valley parking lot because I had gotten a fight with my ex-girlfriend at the time and it was super early in the morning and I wasn't stoked, and I just stormed out of the house and went to Plump Jack's in the right by the tram or the Funatel at Squaw, and I started drinking there. And I was just going to have a couple beers and kind of, like, clear my mind, but then all of a sudden saw some buddies, like, leaving Plump Jack's at, like, 10 a.m., and they were on one, too, and I had, you know, I had some IPAs in me. I was feeling good, so I walked into, you know, uh, the Rocker. And, yeah, the rest was history. I was, like, arrested and thrown in jail by, like, noon. Damn. I, I couldn't even remember. I don't know what happened. By noon? Yeah. I How? fell asleep in my car, and I, I I had started it. I think I even, like, drove a couple of feet. A couple of feet, <laughs> and then just fell asleep with my car, like, right in the middle. Like, thank God it was in park. Like, thank God I didn't hit a little kid or yeah. somebody or anything like that, you know. And, yeah, it was just a scene. Like, I, I made such a scene when the cops got there, and it was like, yeah, it was time. You know, like, that's waking up in jail when you don't even know why you're there is kind of a shitty feeling, you know. And for me and, like, what I want to accomplish and, like, what I'm trying to do with my life and the direction I'm going with, like, alcohol, it's just, it, it alcohol is terrible, bro. It doesn't do anything for anybody, I feel like. I mean, It'd be nice if I could just have a couple because it does, it is a nice thing. It seems like for skiers and snowboarders, like to have a sick day and like be able to go have one beer and talk about like how sick the day was. But like, I can't do that. Some people just can't do it. I can't, I can't, you know, it's just like how I smoke weed and shit. You know, I take the tobacco out like any addictive ingredient and I don't like weed's not addictive. It's not, it's not, I'm living proof that marijuana is not even close to addictive because I had smoked so much, and it was because I was putting tobacco in the joints, and all tobacco really does, if you're smoking spliffs, it's like, before you're even done, you're already thinking like, yo, I, another, your next another, one. another one wouldn't be bad at this point. There's <laughs> yeah. bad homies around. Let's fucking smoke, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's like snowballs. And I lived that for so long, dude, where it was like, it's insane. So, like, I notice it right when I take tobacco out. It's like I smoke one joint a day at night. 
Because, like, I have a lot to think about. I know I have a lot going on for myself. I have to talk to people. I have to be able to communicate with people in a way where they're like, no way, this kid's on point. And, like, if I smoke now without tobacco, like, there's no chance of that. I have to, like, make sure that I have all my I's dotted, all my T's crossed and everything before I can even have that joint at night. Because, like, I'm getting older. I feel that. And without the tobacco in there, like makes me just realize I wasn't even really smoking weed for like 20 years. I've just been smoking cigarettes. Yeah, you've been really just wanting those, the cig out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like with anything, you know, I can't, if I do something and I'm into it, I'm going to go all in, which is great with skiing, terrible for drugs and alcohol. And that's what I've noticed myself. Like it's, it's hard to do these things. It's hard to, it's hard because every day I still, I still think about it, you know. I still think, like, maybe I can, I'm good. Maybe I can have a couple drinks. Maybe, maybe, but at the end of the day, I just know after trial and error, because that's all we can do as human beings to, like, get better and, like, learn from mistakes is, like, if it didn't work once and you try it again and it didn't work and you try it again and it didn't work... It's like the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result when you're just getting the same result. And I realized like I was completely insane. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing one can learn about themselves, you know. It's like I'm a psychopath, but it's like I, I know how to control my psychoticness now. Incredible. It's interesting looking at the, it's simple data, right? If I go out and then try to have one beer and I get blacked out every time I try to have one beer, we, but we somehow can skew the data, right? The data doesn't, you can, you can adjust the data to where, ah, you know, I don't think that data was right. I think, I think I, no, I think Well, I this person was out there and like, well, he's not going to be there. So now it'll be totally mellow. It's like, no, totally. dude, it's you, you know, like yeah. you're the problem if like you can't control it. And it's just like, I've had so many years of trying to control it. And I was so over waking up, just be, like not remembering a thing feeling like shit, feeling the Red Bull coursing through my veins from having, like, 20 Red Bull vodkas still, and then, like, waking up at X Games or something, having, like, the whole town look at you being like, holy fuck, dude, there's that kid. Like, Jesus fucking Christ, I didn't even think he was going to be alive. And then all of a sudden you're seeing that, and that you don't even want to conversate with these people, Mm -hmm. but you can tell, like, you fucked up. Mm -hmm. And you're like, holy shit, dude, like, what happened? And then all of a sudden you see homies, and they're just shaking their head like, dude, you did it again, huh? (laughs) And you're like, yo, that's a shitty feeling, And you don't even know what you did. Yeah, at all. Damn. Well, that's, I want to run back too, because you look at the, it's kind of like the cost. I don't want to say the cost of fame, but in some senses, if you look at where you, you, your trajectory, you know, kid from Montana, overnight success, six figures at age 17 or whatever it is. And then, you know, just exponentially going up from there, contests, fame, money, people surrounding you and in, in, in a culture that encourages partying and and then the pressures that all come along with that and you kind of you know you there there's you know maybe no coping skills along no the, dude the and like all i learned way. about alcohol when i was young is like yo i can like have sex with w- girls like this because like i wasn't that i didn't have a lot of confidence before like winning contests and everything like my confidence was real quiet like it was like is like plotting like how I'm going to go about this and like how I'm going to learn this and then how I'm going to go get to this plate and, and do what I just learned and like keep it going, you know? And so like, I never really thought about chicks or anything. And once alcohol came into my life, I was like, damn dude, this shit is like, it gives me the courage to do whatever I can. And that's all alcohol made me realize is like, I can, I can hook up with chicks. And when you're young and stuff, dude, like hooking up with chicks, it's good. I mean, for, for certain people, for me, it was great because, like, it, it brought another certain level of confidence where I'm like, whoa, dude, I didn't even imagine ever laying next to a gal like this. And then all of a sudden, it's like every weekend you're, like, oh, saying the same thing. And then all of a sudden you're, like, hooking up with chicks you've never even thought was possible. And so that's, a, that, that, that's dangerous. You're mixing star power with, like, a serious substance like alcohol. That's, that's, that's dangerous. And I just thank God that, you know, I haven't had, like, a kid or, uh, and and why I say thank God I haven't had a child or something like that is because if I were to have a child right now and it was from one of those, like, alcohol-induced moments and nights, like, I've seen, like, horror stories of some people that have 
done that, like hooked up one night stand and then had a kid and then has, has had a relationship with a counterpart that has been so unhealthy for their lives and it did nothing good. It did nothing good for the kid's life. It did nothing good. And that's all alcohol re- related. So like the fact I never, the fact I never had a kid, the fact that I never like literally had the shit kicked out of me in a way where it's just like, and there's probably a couple instances where I was at a bar talking shit to the wrong people where it could have so easily happened, where I could have ended my ski career. Like, I could have got beat to a bloody pulp to the point where I couldn't have skied anymore. And, like, thinking about stuff like that, dude, it's 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 so... If, if shit were to end like that, if all this... If, like, I couldn't go ski and do all these things that I got in my brain because of something like that, that's so unacceptable. It's so unacceptable, man, especially, like, for the where I take inspiration from and like what I think is really cool in this life. Like, yeah, it would have been pretty sad to know, like this would have all came to an end because of drugs or alcohol. Yeah. I know a guy who got their knee taken in by a baseball bat and his career ended that way. And that's, that's, it's a serious thing because dude, like when, when you're killing it and you're at these parties and you get fucked up, you, if you're not a cocky fucking dude, you're you're lucky, cause like that doesn't really happen. I show me one kid that's mad young that's f- straight killing it right yeah, now. You're gonna that get gets cocky. that gets hammered. Yeah. That's just like oh no oh please and thank you sir no this, like it has manners all this shit they go all out the fucking window dude very rare yeah very rare. So I have a question. While this is all happening, did it couple with dark times as well? Oh bro, yeah the darkest of times. The darkest of darkest of times, you know? And, uh, shoot, alcohol is just crazy because, like, dog, I have a lot of buddies that, you know, I I know that are struggling even now, you know, whether it be alcohol or drugs. I mean, it can basically debilitate everything that you thought you knew. And not only thought you knew, you do know 100% and you're physically capable of. That's the crazy thing to me. That's when the deep, dark hole starts slipping in is because when you get so ingrained in drinking or doing drugs, you start questioning your ability and you start questioning your self-worth. You start questioning, like, is it is this even worth it? Not even your self-worth. Like, is it is this, like, because at some point you're going to want to start fucking partying your face off if you're hurt or something and to know that like it's what is it that saying like the 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 juice is worth the squeeze or something whatever that is that yep that's all right that's 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 it so like i just realized that and i hope that i can give other people inspiration that may be struggling right now because like my life it's the the juice is shredding you know what i mean that at the end of the day like my life is shredding and shredding such a small part of people's lives, you know what I mean? But that's the one thing I know, like, if I can go do that even for an hour or two hours a day, that's where my self-worth, that's where my mental health, that's where everything is is actually attained or, or, or I have control of, you know? And I realized as time was going on that maybe I was skiing to party like I would I would ski and I would try to go so hard and then when something great would happen I was like okay here we go you know what I mean and I did that like again trial and error trial and error and it got me to the point where dude I was like treating my friends like shit I think like my rock bottom was like you know treating a significant other like really like shit my parents my brother my like you know my rock bottom is when I really started like lashing out at like the ones that really truly love me and that will always be there for me, you know. And that's the type of deep, dark hole where it's like you got to be careful. Because, like, I'm not going to lie. Like, there was parts, like, I actually have thought about taking my own life in those, when I've been in those situations. Where it's just like, I can't deal anymore. I can't do this. I just don't want this feeling anymore. And you And you don't even really realize that it's literally your substance abuse. You know, and that's why I give a lot to like, like weed for me, man, it's, it's, weed was the one thing that always made me like on my shit in a way, like weed half the time would not make me want to drink. 
Like, if everybody's getting ready to go out, and, like, I had a spliff before, like, the movement out the door to have a big night, like, half the time I was like, dude, I ain't going. Yeah, you retreat, Like, this seems right? like a <laughs> lot of work, you know what I mean? And I, and I would have to replay those scenarios over in my head to be like, yo, what is wrong with me? Like, why isn't this connecting? You know what I mean? And so I think, you know, weed's not for everybody, but if you know how to, con- if you, if you know how to take a step back and do some, uh, like self evaluation and you can really break it down to like what the root of the problem is and you can, and if weed has been in your life and it has had those things of like, well, I don't really want to spend this money right now. I don't really want to go drink right here. I don't, that's what marijuana did to me. It always made me question, am I doing the right thing? And that's why I'm like, wow, the whole thing about a gateway drug and all this stuff. Like I don't like for me personally, I don't believe that. It opened, a, it opened like a path for me to make a right decision in my life and a conscious one and be okay with that conscious decision of like, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. I don't need pain pills. I don't need cocaine. I don't need any of this shit anymore because like what I get through marijuana is like a meditative, like a meditation vibe in a way where like that's how I got into meditation was smoking weed and actually like calming myself down to be like, okay, this feels weird, but at least like if I'm in this state of mind, maybe I can start figuring out who to talk to. Cause like in a meditation space for me, I just learned like I talk to a higher power and not, not, not necessarily God, not necessarily anything. It's my higher power that basically I learned through AA and through smoking weed pretty much, you know? And like the AA situation, when I got that DUI, it wasn't even, it did, they didn't even make me go. Like the courts didn't even appoint it. I just hit a point in my life where like nothing made sense. You know what I mean? And, you know, I got an uncle that's been sober for 40 years now and he still goes to AA pretty much like twice a week. But before that he was going to like three sessions a day, you know, but that's like, that was his path, you know? And so I did, I did AA in Kings Beach in Tahoe for like six straight months, every single solitary day while blown on alcohol monitors and just trying to find the answers to like, what is happening to me and like, how can I control this? You know? And yeah, I think, I just think, you know, it's insane. And I hope people that do get to that point, like it's not hard to realize like when shit goes overboard, you know, if, if people are getting away from you, if you're not having the same people hit you up every day and you're hanging around a bunch of people that want to just party with you, instead of like, see you do well, like those are the signs you got to be looking for, man. Not everybody has your best interests. And that's what I've learned. Like nine times out of 10, your enemies are going to be the ones you've been hanging out with a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it sucks to have that self-realization. It really does. But dude, I mean, if you learn that and you can be okay with that, that's like, that's growth right there, bro. Cause you, that like you, once you learn that waking up and leaving the house, like I'm solid and I'm not going to drink alcohol or do any drugs. I'm solid that I have enough confidence to talk to whoever I need to talk to. I'm solid. Whether you like me or not, I don't give a shit because I'm still here and I have the confidence that I did not used to have. Mm-hmm. I used to just hit fucking decline on my phone every time somebody would call me, even parents and stuff. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can't do that. Avoiding, yeah. avoiding, yeah. avoiding, avoiding. Yeah. You know and why? Were, why were you avoiding? That's a, well. That's the trait of somebody using, and it's not feeling well a lot of times. You know, that's a that's a general. I I see a lot in you know avoidant in the people in my life that have have done that. It's it's a telltale sign. Also, another another sign you were talking about earlier is pushing people away. And if you have a friend and you're worried about them and they're pushing you away, chances are they're in a bad place. Yep. So that's another another telltale sign. You're like, dude, I just tried to help my friend and he was a fucking dick. He pushed me away. Well, you might want to push a little harder because they're probably they're probably in a bad space. Another note is like, hey, if you're looking to get sober, AA, great fucking way to do it. And then lastly, the reason why I asked that question is like, hey, were you in a dark place? I just think it's important for people to know. Like somebody like Tanner Hall fucking won all the shit, was in that same dark place. The person that's listening to this that's maybe feeling that way, that maybe thinks they're alone, they're not. Everybody goes through shit. Everybody goes through struggles. It's fucking normal. That's why we talk about it. Now, what I want to get into is after you ended up quitting drinking and all that shit, what were the lifestyle changes? Did you start hitting the gym or did you start getting crazy on that? Because that's a yeah. common switch, right? Yeah, I definitely went psycho on the gym. You know, that was that was the big thing. And I never really, 
like I've been in the gym before, but I've always been in the gym, like still getting, like putting the substance in my body. You know what I mean? And like the day I stopped doing drugs and drinking, it was like, holy smokes. Like the level of strength that I gained was like second to none. Like that's why I'm still here. You know Basically, what I mean? Basically the substance was holding you back. You're yeah. working out and not really achieving any goals. 100. And that's why, and essentially why I broke both my legs and tore both ACLs is because I got so bad with my drinking and drug use that I didn't have any muscle. I wasn't going to the gym. I wasn't eating food. I wasn't doing anything. Yeah, you I was eating, partying right? and skiing. Yeah. And that you, you're only going to get away with that until like. Until you don't. <laughs> until your legs break or knees, knees joints. And what sucks is, dude, in this industry, it's hard, bro. Like, it's hard because we're adrenaline driven, right? Like, if you're a rider, it's hard to spot, like, who's having a problem and who's not. It's really hard, dude, because we're all adrenaline fucking junkies, dude. It's like you can't. Kids, too, generally as well. Oh, it's crazy. And it's like it's it's, it's nuts to me to learn how many people actually struggle with this shit. You know what I mean? And it only takes, like, getting hurt once. It only takes, like, fuck, dude, it can be something as simple as asking a girl out and she just clowns on you. And then all of a sudden that's all it took. And then you're. Your confidence is shattered to a point where only substance is going to bring it back. Bring it back up. If we and those are type of, of things like you would never even think because you're like, oh, well, this somebody I look up to is like, wait, what? You're like he asked a girl out and they didn't sit. I thought you guys just fucked whatever you wanted to. And it's just like, no, dude, like there's every aspect of life is like I'm just as scared as anybody else about yeah. anything, you know, probably more. But it's like if you are just if you don't want to actually wonder why you get so bummed out or you're so you get anxiety or you if you if you don't want if you if you start feeling all this stuff and you don't have a want to like go figure it out like substance is what you're going to turn to yep it's true yeah easy and it's readily available available everywhere bro we i grew up in the era of like 2001 when i came into this shit like it was cool to do drugs and drink Mm -hmm. your team managers were feeding you it and now to see it with, like, Olympics and everything, like, kids can't be fucked up. Like, if you, I mean, they can. Like, film kids can get whatever they want. Like, you can go get fucked up and still, like, if you are your, if you have a grip on it, you can still go out and get clips. But I'm going to be here to tell you, it's only going to last for a certain amount of time. Because until you can get your shit together, dude, you're going to come, you, you, it's, it's going to come to a point where injury is going to change the course of your life if you don't clean your shit up. It's not if, but when. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your body's just not yeah. performing right. And it's when I'm looking at these right. little Olympic kids now, it's like they can't do that, dude. The level of fucking shredding, like Jesus Christ, that shot of Sven Torgman, like out in fucking the Prime Park, just like it's like the normal Instagram clip that's being replayed every day now, where he does triple backside rodeo, and oh, he's yeah. like getting. It's I'm like, he, you can't get fucked up. No, you, go you gotta be that. on your shit. On yeah. your shit, dude. That <laughs> trick looks so fucking scary, and it's just like holy yeah. shit, dude. One little. Dude, you catch your tail side edge on landing and slap the back of your head. You, that's lights out. Yeah, you're done. Especially on a back rodeo, too. It's like the way you come around on that trick is so much impact because you pop so hard. So you got to be in good shape. You can't do that trick if you're not going to the gym and taking care of yourself straight up. And that dude shot in the Scandinavians, too, where he, like, front boards that fucking thing, then backside two or backside mm. 180s onto the down rail. The 50-50 back two. Or yeah, like, whatever yeah. that was. That was yeah. so fucked, dude. I'm looking at those shots where I'm like, you kids can't. It's either you're going to fucking commit to, like, being one of the gnarliest fucking kids that's going to put himself into so much danger every day and be good with that, or you're going to just party. I want to know what your take is on coaching in skiing and the sport and snowboarding and all that. It's tough for me. I, I coaching. I mean, like, I don't know. It's hard because coaches, depending on who they are, it's it can be good to to get help from somebody. But then, like for me to look at what it's done to the younger generation, like creativity is being pulled from our sport right now. Because if you got somebody telling you how to do something, when to eat food, what time your flight's at, you got to get in the van now. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to fucking not think for yourself. Do what I tell you. Put on your mask and be a good boy. It's like I don't really know if that's a good thing for these young fifteen to sixteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen year old kids to 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 have. Because the one thing that we had when we were mad young coming up is, like, how to think for ourselves and how are we going to go out and get it ourselves. Now it's like kids don't really have to think for themselves anymore, and they've got some dude appointed to them that the whole country 
like like the country of Japan, the country of the United States, the all these countries appoint these these specific people to these groups of kids, and I'm like, wow, okay, it's kind of nuts, dude. Because I even like I was in Copper, I think early season last year, <laughs> and it was right after a pipe event, and my homie Taylor Seaton. Like, took me into the condo, like a U.S. team condo, just for a second, because he had to do some interview with this, fucking, I don't know, like a newspaper or something. I just remember being in there, and, like, one of the U.S. team kids is, like, sitting in a bathtub with, like, mad rubber duckies in there and shit. And I'm kind of like, you know, in my brain, I was like, what the fuck is going on, dude? Like, this is some weird-ass shit. How old are we talking about? I think, like, like 18, 19, or 20. Okay. And I don't know, maybe that's, I, I don't know who the kid is, I don't know his background, but I know that he's been coached a lot, and he sits in a bathtub at night, or whenever after a contest, and he's not, like, it's not showering and stuff, it's like sitting in a bathtub with, like, mad rubber duckies, and that was like a metaphor in my brain to be like, oh my god, dude, is this what fucking happening, like, is this what, like, coaching is bringing into skiing, is just making kids into children again? Because, like, you don't have to think for yourself, you don't really have to do much. And you're getting, like, taken around. And now it's like, if it's not your coach, it's your agent. And if it's not your agent, it's this, your publicist. If it's not your publicist, it's like, if you got all this shit around you, like, your creative outlook is kind of distorted. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm not saying you can't come up with tricks and stuff. Like, obviously, if you're at a point with your writing that you, you, you're going to be able to think of some shit to do. But, like, dude, ski, like they say in Aspen Extreme, dude, skiing's the easy part, Carl. <laughs> it's like how you attack, how you do it off the hill mm -hmm. that makes it that much better about when you come back on the hill of like how much better you're going to get and whatnot. Dude, uh, I want to just highlight something you were talking about earlier with the, it, what you're kind of describing is like coaching, which is like structured play. And there's a documentary on HBO. I don't remember the name of it, but they basically studied a bunch of def different athletes. They studied Wayne Gretzky and a bunch of other guys. And out of all the pro athletes, the thing that separated the, the, good professionals to the greats like Gretzky was unstructured play. Like Wayne Gretzky, for example, he grew up playing pond hockey. So he would skate around on the ice and basically they would play their own games of hockey into a trash can. And, you know, he learned how to play behind the net and all these things. But essentially it all came from essentially not being coached and being creative and, you know, just circling back around. It's literally exactly what you just said. And they, they prove that in this documentary of the good to great is the unstructured, the unstructured play where kids learn how to do it on their own. So interesting footnote, but well, yeah. And when we're young, it's like, it was the, it was your rat pack. That's mm -hmm. how you got better. It was like you would see a homie do something that you wanted to do for so long. And you're like, wait, you didn't even tell me you knew how to fucking do that. And then all of a sudden next run you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Cause it's that like, it's that like you, you, you feed if off you of your it, homies. You exactly. Yeah. And especially with how close you are when you're a young kid with like your shred crew. Mm -hmm. Those are like, that's like, you're out there with like, like homies and it's dope being young. Cause you don't even know how to lie and shit yet. You know, there's no reason to lie. And it's like, if you do <laughs> lie, it's like dumbass, like little fucking, like I saw fucking a pterodactyl in the sky the other day. And you're <laughs> little, like, yeah, white sweet. Lie. you know what I mean? Like something dumb. <laughs> That's that is true. a great example of what a kid would say. Hey, I want to get into a, another Patreon question. It's from your buddy, uh, Scotty the Body from Wild, an air horn. <laughs> Wild Mike's, one of our biggest fans. So uh, you've won so many major contests, and I was lucky enough to have been with you at both the X Games and the Dew Tour before you dropped in the half pipe after all the riders have gone, and you basically had to land a perfect run to win, which you ended up doing. After the contest, I would ask you if how are you able to handle that pressure? You always said your mind was already at the after party before you dropped in. I was wondering if you could talk about that mindset and how your process works. Well, that mindset was... And if that changed after yeah. you quit drinking. Yeah, yeah for real. <laughs> it's a great question. Well, I mean... I f yeah, no, I mean, at, at, at some point when I, was in the, when, I, when I was in the realm of like year after year winning... And I was in the zone. It was like I was doing so much prep early season that when I went to, when I would get to contest, I could just see like kids that didn't prep. I could see just on the look on their faces and stuff. You know, I'm very in tune with like body movements and 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 and, and looks and like eyes where they're going, everything. You know, I'm very intuitive with that type of shit. I can read people very well. And I think that really helped me out with contest because I just knew if I did everything that I could to prepare. 
and not get hurt and be feeling good, by the time I got in that start gate, you're like, people are going to have a big problem, like a big problem. And that's like to be able to find that zone and be able to stay in that zone. I just, I, I found a routine, man, and I stuck with it. That's like anything in life. Like you just find a routine. You know, that's a, like, that, that's, that has everything to do with mental health and everything. And like your, 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 your self-esteem, your, your, your general outlook on everything. Like if you have a good routine in life and it, it might feel like it gets repetitive, but don't like have, like, let those feelings just brush them off because repetitive, there's nothing bad with being repetitive. Repetition is the father of learning. And so that was like kind of how I looked at it. You know what I mean? And I would just do it over and over and over again. I'd pick my run in like November and I'd just do it over and over again at Mammoth or June. And June Mountain, big, big respect. Hopefully that <clears throat> place can come back. But I just remember doing everything that I could and just do repetition, just getting miles. You know what I mean? Because I knew kids weren't out there like with my mentality like back in the day. Like, skiers still didn't have, like, I think I was the first, like, real psychopath with all this shit. <laughs> and I think, like, Henrik saw the psychoticness, and he's like, yo, I found his, like, his equation is as clear as day. It's not like I was hiding anything. It's not like it's a secret. It's just, like, do you want to be that, like, gnarly on how you go about, like, your skiing, and you're, like, doing everything you can to get to where you need to be. And that's just all repetition. And a lot of people, I think, can get bored with stuff if they keep doing it over and over again. But, like, if you love that feeling, like, that feeling I was talking about, like, like that feeling I, I, I'm still chasing to this day. If you have that and then you realize what repetition can do for yourself, that's the deadliest combination a skier or snowboarder could have, like, going into a contest. That mentality, that is the winning formula right there. And I see Henrik. Like, I see how he does it. And I see... I just see it. I, I, I see, like, what I had in, like, and how I passed it off to a couple of my homies where I'm like, wow, dude. Like, out of, like, a lot of stuff that I'm proud of is, like, getting off of alcohol and maybe passing that to Henrik are, like, two of my biggest, like, things I'm most proud of. Because, like, skiing, you know, skiing needs a dude like Henrik. And I've always said it, like, when Henrik gets, when he's done competing, the shit's going to get pretty stale. So there's a lot of, like, I don't know, bro. Like, there's there's a lot of... I mean, there's one gymnastics out in the world, right? We don't really need another one. <laughs> and, so Henrik, and Henrik don't... He's like, you watch him come through a finish line, and that motherfucker be doing some weird-ass shit with his Blue hands. Things, yeah. Just, yeah, like, I've seen that. Doing all kinds of weird shit, and, like, that's, that's fun. Mm -hmm. When I watch that, I'm like, fuck, dude, this kid is having way mm -hmm. more fun than the kid that came through, and I was like, oh, yeah, well, first jump didn't go so good, and I didn't get my mute grab, so hopefully the second jump's going to be a lot better, and I uh, can really bring, it, really bring it home for the third jump, you know, but we're working. And you're just like, dog, <laughs> it just sounds so generic, you know what I mean? So it's like, to see Henrik coming through and having as much fun that he has, but then all of a sudden, like, right when it's time to get back on that sled and go back up, it's like that smile gets wiped off his face, and it's straight, just like eyes gazing back to the lip, and it's like, here we go again. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is like, that's priceless, bro. That's a priceless, that's a priceless, uh, I don't even know, it's a priceless thing to be able to, to, to pass on to somebody, and, you, and, and it's hard to pass it on. Because I didn't sit down with Henrik and be like, here's the formula, dude, now do this. We've never talked about it. But that kid always, like, he's, he's always, he's the most, he's full of gratitude, right? So it's like, that dude just called me actually two nights ago. And he just landed in Denver. And he, like, he just wanted to let me know, like, yo, gee, like, just wanted to say big up, like, you're the reason why I'm here. And I'm like, well, like, big up, G, but, like, fucking A, like, I... I don't even know what to say to that. Like, go, you know what you're doing right now. You did it last year. You like, cause I, me and him were tied with the most golds until last year at the big air where he won his eighth and he surpassed me. And it's like, it was insane because the homie comes up to him, puts a mic in his face and they're like, yo, you just, you just surpassed Tanner Hall with the most gold medals. And like, how are you feeling? You're sitting on top of the world. You have, you have the most gold medals any skier in the world. Like, how are you feeling right now? Homie goes off for, like, two straight minutes about, like, why he doesn't count it 
and why I have more medals because he has way more opportunities to get medals with like a knuckle huck and a big air here and like X Games <laughs> Europe and all wow. this stuff. And he's like, he's like, when Tanner was doing it, no, he would just win that shit back to back to back. So I don't even think he fucking counts this shit. So I'm not going to, I'm like, oh my God, dude. Like, little man showing like a shit ton of respect. So it's like, that's cool. He, I know he knows that program, but yet he would never say it. But he's, 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 he, He's very, he's very good at letting me know, like, dude, like, thank you very much. That's cool. And not even telling me what he's thankful for. And I know it's just like, that's that common bond me and have, me and that little man have together. So dope. It's, dude, there's a, a bunch of incredible things in, in that past little uh, segment you are just talking. And, like, one, when I think about H Henrik, he's got that, uh, that inten intangible thing we like to describe on here as flavor. You know, it's just like, and, and you want to know who to root for, right? You, you you go back to the guy who's talking about, well, I hope my third run goes better. You know, that impersonation. Like, when you don't have personality, you don't root for him. When you see the guy coming across the finish line and he's like, you know, like he's got Wu-Tang in his headphones or whatever's going on, you're like, I, I like that guy. He's like, kind of seems like he's having a good time out there. Well, you know what's crazy, too? Yeah. A lot of those kids that are getting beat by Henrik, yeah. there's been a lot of, like, kids are starting to now hate on him and say that he's getting scored way too high and he's been getting gifts now for for far too long where I'm like, even other homies, like, that are the best skiers in the world that are more near Henrik's age had to go on their social medias just last week and be like, yo, I've heard a lot of talk about, like, some of the other athletes complaining about why Hanky gets the scores that he does and, like, why he's getting it what it is. And here's why I'm going to tell you thing you just said. First thing that came out of Magnus's mouth was he has flavor, mm -hmm. and you guys gotta realize that. And how he looks at it is not, not how you're it's looking at it. Not fucking gymnastics based exactly. sport. And going back to one other thing, which you hear the constant we hammer on all the time, and I'm fascinated because I love watching fucking sports documentaries and all this shit. And it's it's fun to to kind of like dissect humans and how they how they are able to achieve great things at times. And when you look at you know it's consistency. You know, like people people hide behind talent. But you look at consistency, and it's it's not one thing that happens. It's not like oh, this person was born with this special thing, and all of a sudden they went they have something different that I don't have. But it, it's incremental gains over a small, long period of time. So it's like if every day you go up, and every day maybe you you work, improve, learn a new grab, but it's just one small step. It's all small steps over time, like you're saying. Like yeah, but what Henrik has too, next to all those other kids, Henrik's out like stacking street clips. He's out point. in the back country yeah. doing trips into like first track yeah. landings. He's out there doing stuff where these kids are like, "Well, I just did a double cork 1980. Why didn't I beat him?" And it's like, "Well, dude, you, you're wearing size schmedium. 1980. Is that a, is that a going on these days? 1980. Yeah." yeah. That's what skiers are hitting? Yeah, the Holy size shit. medium skiers are doing 1980s <laughs> and, and and complaining why they're not beating <laughs> Henrik when it's just like that see like it it should be a common sense thing, but I guess if you're chucking a 1980 and not standing on the podium, you're it, it might bug you out a little bit, but yeah, if you don't that. understand why Henrik is beating you at mm -hmm. this point, like I then you're probably never going to get it. You're never going to get yeah. it. You're never going to get it, man. And that's a problem with skiing and like these coaches, like cuz a lot of the kids that are complaining about Henrik are coached day in, day out. Like day in, day out. Henrik doesn't Dude, Henrik's the the, the the sweetest national team fucking coach. I think Henrik got to appoint it and it's Henrik's best friend Nicholas Erickson that he got to grow up skiing with. Mm -hmm. So, so imagine that, dude. It's just like his homie that he's in the start gate with. Yeah. That's and like Nicholas ain't good. What is Nicholas going to fucking tell Henrik? Oh, dip your shoulder a little harder on that nose butter triple 16. No, he ain't saying anything, dude. He's like, yo, he's motherfucker, like, oh, you rip. got this. You know, this, is what, this is what, do what he does. You do. Yeah, he says at the top, he says, make sure you have fun out there. And that's it. That's his job. That's, that's his it. job. Yeah. Pat him on the back. Yo. Okay, let's get into, uh, I got to talk to a good friend of yours. Um Named Neil Provo. Yeah. And we are going to get into the guest question, which is presented by Solomon Snowboards. Now, recently, I tested out the Solomon Sleepwalker. I was up with Stony Buds. Uh, it is an extremely soft board, perfect jib board. Tommy Gesme rides that thing and absolutely destroys it. So, uh, yeah, Solomon supports us. You should support them. Check out SolomonSnowboards.com. And with that, we will get into the guest question from Neil Provo. Here we go. What up, Easton and Grandies? This is Neil Provo calling in with a question for my boy Tanner Hall, a.k.a. Doug Dugout. 
Tanner, when the ankle heals up this time around, I wanted to see if you've got any redemption plans to get back up to Alaska, come do some some glacier camping with me again. <laughs> Don't forget those puffy pants, brother. <laughs> Woo! I heard you guys had a wild AK trip. Oh, God, dude. Well, Neil, to tell you the truth, dude, I'd be more than happy to go up and camp in Al an Alaskan glacier with you on a high-pressure system. I do not want to go back and do what I just did a while back with, yeah, I don't know. Me and Ian, Ian and Neil Provo, if you guys don't know, they're – Two brothers that live up in Park City, Utah, that are just insane mountain people. And like not just wintertime, they are summertime. They are like they are very and they're 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 mountain men. Like that's what they do. They know mountains and they know how to move around them. They know how to catch fish in them. They know how to bike in them. They know how to hike in them. They know how to they know how to do everything. <laughs> so they had been snow camping quite a bit. We're up in Alaska. This is like twenty fifteen or yeah, twenty fifteen. Or 16, one of the two. But it was just insane because I get up there. I'm, I'm on a heli trip for a little bit trying to stack some footage. But then it was like the whole plan was like Ian and Neil were going to get into town. Pete Alport was going to come in from Bend, Oregon. And then John Spriggs was going to – we're all going to just get a bunch of food. We got a bunch of tents. We got, we got all the gear that we needed. And we're going to fly back, sit – like camp right next to this mountain called Tomahawk and basically – Try to go hike lines, right? <coughs> well, I'd never snow camped in my life, and these dudes have. I think I took out, I think my jacket wasn't even waterproof that I took out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did that. It was insane. Just go we, pure cotton? Pure we're talking? cotton. <laughs> Bro, we got 15 feet of snow in nine days. What? It, it was like, that's why he said dug, dug out, because that's like literally what I did. I dug out my tent the fucking entire time until day seven, where I remember, and this is like the fact, like I remember when it was daytime on this day, I'm like in the kitchen tent with Spriggs looking at him like, I'm starting to worry for my life. <laughs> really? Oh, I've never worried for my life. <laughs> and you were worrying for I'm, your life. I started worrying for my life. And it was fucked because I just remember, dude, I was soaking wet the entire time. Ian and Neil give us these fucking microfiber towels that are washcloths, right? They're literally like this big. And they're like, okay, so like when your tent gets a little wet or your sleeping bag is just a little wet from condensation, here's just microfiber towel. They dry out really well. Just wipe them down with this. <laughs> you were squeezing. <laughs> oh, dog. <laughs> By like day two or three, I'm fucking in my tent, in my sleeping bag. I'm, it's so, everything's soaking wet. I'm, I'm fucking taking this rag and doing this to my tent. It, water's falling on me. It's making me soaking wet. I'm like wringing out the fucking thing. It's drenched. And that's like kind of like, this is not okay, dude. Like, this is not all good. Cause I'd look, I'd like look outside and see Ian and Neil. In, like, fucking Mount Everest gear. Like, they were, like, look like marshmallows. They look like astronauts. They had all the waterproofing gear. They, had they didn't everything. tell you that you had well, to they have that I stuff? mean, they did. They, they did. <laughs> but if you don't go snow camping, yeah. G, and, it's like, gnarly. I don't know. At one point, dude, on day four, it, like, was borderline raining. So, like, the snow was, like, this fucking big. It just, like, it would touch your tent. It would just go soaking wet. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is not good. And just the amount of shoveling I would have to do, I was like, it'd make me sweat like crazy. And I think, like, that storm was really gnarly. I yeah. think, like, not a lot of people will go out and have it that bad. But, yeah, I remember, like, I think it was night seven where Pete wow. Alport, like, comes up, and it's, like, three in the morning. He's like, T, it's time to dig out, dude. You're looking pretty buried. And right when I woke, he woke me up, I just remember I, that's the, that, that, was the, that was my breaking point fucking lost it i think i started yelling at him being like i don't give a fuck pete then dig my shit out because i'm fucking over this dude let me fucking bury myself this is the stupid shit just started fucking losing it right and so i didn't get out of my tent and i fucking just remember i had a pre-roll in my tent and i was like fuck it dude i'm gonna smoke one i'm gonna pass out so i smoked one oh i fucking passed out dude and i think at like fucking like five in the morning or so it only took like an hour where I was like, I open my eyes and I'm like, damn, it's mad dark in here. Cause usually like my tent was up and when I'd open my eyes, like I could see like the like just orange or something, right? Because yeah. I had an orange black diamond tent. And I just remember opening up my eyes and being like, fuck, it's mad dark. I was like, time to dig. So I like go to sit up 
And I'm like laying down and I get up and it's just like, no, oh, fuck, dude, are you kidding me? And then I'm like looking and I put my hand out, my whole tent, like I'm underneath the snow. My tent's fucking gone. Pete didn't dig you out, huh? No, Pete, <laughs> poor it didn't dig me out. That's the damn truth. And so what was crazy, though, I was so over it. That pissed me off even more than Pete telling me it was time I to dig out my to. tent. You know what I did? I straight up in my sleeping bag, I just go, as hard as I can and just try to fucking open that thing up. I popped out of my fucking tent and breached the snow, and it's still dark. It's pounding. And I just start going... Why me, God? <laughs> no! Just flipping, dude. It was the worst. It was the worst. So, like, now my tent's fucked. My sleeping, all my clothes, everything's fucked. I, like, start feeling like I'm getting sick and shit. And I'm like, oh, this is, like, the whole, like, start worrying for my life. Yeah, it, like, I started really worrying for my life right there. And I basically slept in the dome tent for just that night and then the next night. And then on day nine, we had a tiny little break in the weather. And it was fucked up because it was like a break in the weather and we're all like looking at the new, like the weather and whatnot. And it just, it looked like just this another supercell was about to just engulf <laughs> us. I call up Drake. I was like, dude, get me the fuck out of here. Like I cannot, like I didn't want to look at my ski boots. I didn't want to think about skiing. I didn't want to hike lines. I didn't want to be there. And so I get, I get me and Spriggs and Pete, we all get taken out of the back country. And then all of a sudden, nine days of high pressure just sank in and Ian and Neil just went and fucking crushed. But I mean, <laughs> those at, guys were loving it. Dude, at that, time, right? you know, 100. And I think Aspen and Rain Weaver was there. And then uh, a couple of their other homies like actually flew out and took our spots in the camp spot. But I mean, even, even if we'd known that nine day high pressure was there, there's People no over it. I was so yeah. over it. I've dude. heard I've heard the snow camping's not not for it sucks. everybody. Yeah. Dude, it sucks. sucks. Dude, it yeah. sucks. Bro. I don't know why people do it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's insane. You're just basically setting yourself up for what just happened to you. Disaster. You know, like, I mean, even if it was like starry nights and everything, it's like still it, cold it would have been get tough. Wet out shooting, 100. you know. And if it you don't dry, you're you're screwed. <laughs> And it just really re re made me realize, like, Ian and Neil go out in the backcountry all the time. They, like, they know how to build their wind walls. They're good. They know, like, what gear. They know minimalist packing. Like, they're very smart, very... They're in, built for this shit. Yeah, they're built for it, you know? And I got... That was my first realization. Like, I could have probably had a better intro to snow camping, but I think my first snow camping experience was kind of like... I never want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people say that, though, yeah. even yeah. on different conditions. Yeah. You'll hear me, dude. I Even in this movie, Ring the Alarm, there's an excerpt where I was like, yo, I give it up to people like Jeremy Jones and those type of dudes because, like, <laughs> that's no fucking joke, dude. I made me realize, like, I like having a hot shower after shredding. I like watching, like, some Amenities, TV. Amenities, man. I like, yeah, I like, I like hot food, like, in warm environments. Me you too. know what I mean? Me too. I don't like jet boiling a cup of water and pouring it into a plastic bag and being like, this is great food. It's, <laughs> it's not. not, dude. It's not great food. It's not. It's not dude, there was eating. one point of that camping trip where I remember going outside because I was just so bummed and I was like, fuck, dude, I got to take a piss. I get out of the dome tent and, bro, it was the craziest shit. There was like fucking 200 black crows just fucking parked, like probably like 300 feet away from our tent. And I'm like, yo, what? The They're waiting for you to die that, so they yo, come that's, you. that's where my head went. And Ian and Neil are like, no, these birds, like, they weather the storm. Like, the storm is really, it's it's bad right now. So they're actually, like, just getting a break. And I'm looking at them like, you have, how do you fucking know that, dude? They're out there waiting for us to die so they can come and just that's eat what us. I'm you know thinking, what I mean? Dude. Holy shit, bro. Like, that was the, yeah, that sucked. It sucked. It sucked, dude. That was heavy as fuck. I remember leaving and just, like, looking at Ian and Neil, like, it's good luck, but what's crazy, dude, they fucking stayed out an extra, what was it, an extra 12 days, and on the 11th day out there, they got to the top of Tomahawk, and they shredded the fucking piss out of Tomahawk, and Tomahawk, dude, if you know Haynes and that flying tenure, that's not a fucking small line. They call it Tomahawk because mad fucking people have blown out their fucking knees trying to beat their slough down that run, and they run into their slough, and then they get taken down in a tom. They just Tomahawk to the bottom, and that's like that run has ended multiple like big mountain skiers' careers and shit. Wow. So I'm like, dude, you guys, like the the respect that that notched up for the Provo <laughs> yeah. brothers after that, I was like, yo, you guys should be like. I really hope you start getting some of the respect that you guys deserve because, like, not only are you guys amazing with your camera work, 
You guys are fucking savages. Yeah, and they film, they shoot photos, they, they just do, do it all. It all. Like yeah. it, it's actually like if companies were smart, like they would actually look at Ian and Neil like that's what you really want because they can make you your own. You don't have to hire they can people do it to all. go. They can do it all. You're gonna yeah. have to pay them a little bit more, but paying Ian and Neil a little bit more to have a super high quality product by people that you can trust in the back country that you know if you pay them money to, 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 to make you something, those are the type of kids that will get it done and go above and beyond and make and put their little touch on it and having companies go like, fuck, dude, why are we working with the kid who's just like a little diva that like needs everything and like these people do everything themselves, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's, it's pretty amazing. So true. And a little fun fact, all comes full circle, uh, little Steez. He used to be a Tech Nine rider. Yeah, man. With he's, he's from Dude, the he was streets. in the original movie, <laughs> yeah, Represent. He was yep. in Represent. Drive, wasn't that Cole's Lexus that he was driving to? Yeah. Like, he was 11 years old. Yeah, he and was And he 11. was a little 11 year old. It's crazy. This little street kid ended up being one of the baddest dudes in the backcountry. <laughs> okay. That was an awesome story. <laughs> Tanner Hall, not a big snow camper. Yeah, no, nah. never will be. <laughs> AKA Doug Dugout. Listen, we need to talk about Wild Mics. The fact is, they are a sponsor. And you signed a contract guaranteeing them certain concessions. One of them being spot on the show. Well, that's where I see things just a little differently. Contractor, no, I will not bow to any sponsor. I'm sorry you feel that way. But basically, it's the nature of the beast. Maybe I'm wrong on this one, but for me... The beast doesn't include selling out. Mmm. Stoney, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like, people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. I can't talk about it anymore. It's giving me a headache. Here. Drink one of these. The bomb hole. Banter. Edgy. Cheddar Biscuits. Look, you can stay here in the big leagues and play by their rules, or you can go back to the farm club. It's your choice. Yes, and it's the choice of a bomb hole generation. I'm waiting on my Wild Mike's uh, rap sled. They're going to wrap it like a cheesy bite. And send it out, but we'll see if it shows up. Stony, oh. but Stony if Scotty <laughs> says it's gonna show up. It's gonna show up. He said if I talk about it, it might show up. <laughs> yeah, if we could, we could definitely use two wrapped snowmobiles. That would be ideal. One jalapeno, one normal cheese, <laughs> some cheesy bite, brother sleds. Let's do this. That's an idea and a half. <laughs> so uh, let's let's pivot to another topic here. Uh, free ride world tour. Mm-hmm. That's uh, one one of the many phases. Of Doug Dugout. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Doug, dude. <laughs> Fuck. So, yeah, let's let's dive right into that. Are you a free ride world champion? No. Second oh, overall. Second. No. No. I got second at uh, my first ever stop in Japan. Okay. Mm. Dude, the free ride world tour is no joke, bro. Like, that, that shit to me is, it, it's, it's really sick. I wish, like, like, I wish there was, like, a little bit more incentive to do that tour for an American. Because it costs a lot of money to travel to all those places. And, like, the even if you win an event, there's not a lot of cash. And it's basically, like, you're going to come out more in the hole than on top of <laughs> the hole. Even if you win? <laughs> really? Kind of, man. Do you know if skiing gets paid more than snowboarding in that event? No, it no. doesn't. It's Probably it, even. It's, it's all even. And what the craziest shit was... At the beginning of last year, they're like, well, women now make the same amount as men. Where I'm like, well, that's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about equality. But when you have eight women and like 30 men. Well, that's true. The numbers. I'm kind of like, yo, wait a second here. And there's a lot of like American writers that when you go on that tour, there's not an American stop. And the United States of America sucks with like our insurance policies and like I mean, we got lawyers just waiting for people to slip on a sidewalk so they can be like, do you need a lawyer? Yeah. I can get you money. <laughs> and it's just like, well, that person slipped there by themselves, dude. It's their fault. Like, no way, shape, or form should that person go fucking sue these people for not salting the sidewalk. And that's just the reality. So when you're going from Japan to Canada back to Europe, the first stop's Japan. Then you have to go right to Canada. 
And Canada at Kicking Horse is like kind of close to us, you know, especially me up in Montana. Like I can drive to Kicking Horse. Mm. So it's like, all right, that's the one that's like, that's, that's, that's relatable in my brain. But then all of a sudden it's just like right after Canada, you fly to like Andorra and then you're there and then you're in Fieberbrew in Austria. And then you have to wait a couple of weeks and go to Berbier. And as a European, it's it, it like it's just it's 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 you, you got a lot of connections <laughs> and you got a lot of <laughs> you know you got a lot of places to stay you got a lot of everything, and the free ride world tour it's definitely grown folks skiing ain't nobody like holding your hand out there ain't no like it's 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 all on you, but it's kind of gnarly like your schedule and what's really gnarly about that shit is to travel the whole all the way around the world for one fucking run. You'll be looking at the faces and like, oh, dude, I'm going to fucking kill this. Dude. I'm going to butter off that shit. And then I'm going to fucking come down and dub back that. Then I'm going to do this. And then all of a sudden you get in the start gate and you're like, realize you have one run. And sometimes like where my brain was like fucking hypochondriac sometimes. Like I would get in the fucking start gate and start picturing myself fucking eating shit on the first turn out the gate being like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What am I doing? Like, don't, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> but if there's no backup run, it's really gnarly, dude. It's really gnarly. And, like, I remember my first year, I, you know, had a good result in Japan, had a great run in Canada. Just I didn't really know the criteria, and I just – they wanted me to hit, like, a couple more things. But I, like, ended up doing one of the biggest threes of my life off of, like, a fucking – a big fucking drop. And to be able to do that first – like, first run cold, like, dog, I didn't even – no warm-up runs, no nothing. No looking over the edge. No looking just over the edge. No not how big it's yeah, it look. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, it, it fucks with your mind a bit, so – I mean, I'm not going to lie. I came on with some big dick energy thinking, like, I'm just going to fucking rule this shit. And it was like a slice of humble pie. Yeah, I was competing, but everybody I was competing against, I didn't even fucking really never never even heard of. And kind of hit me like, wow, dude, there's a full other ski industry than the ski industry that I know. And then, yeah, it was like just the one run. And, fuck, I took a crash in Andorra. I took a crash in Feverbrun. And that was, like, debilitating for me. You know what I mean? I was like, damn, dude. Like, you start questioning yourself. Like, yo, do I suck? fuck dude these kids that i never even heard about just lace the fucking a run that looks like i could lace over and over again but it's pretty intense dude there's like choppers flying all around like you're fucking like i don't know like fuck gigi and fucking victor and fucking all these people are around and you're like holy shit dude like yeah fucking hey gigi like she's that, that dude's the man and then all of a sudden you're like ah fuck forget about gigi like, let's think about the contest you know what i mean and it's like <laughs> It's like with that one run thing, it's kind of gnarly, dude. It's really gnarly. And I it it's I really enjoyed it, but I also was like, fuck, dude, it would be so sick. Cause the free ride tour, what I didn't understand is like they're kind of struggling with like a title sponsor and some other things. I'm like, wow, this is like Formula One to me. Like this is like kind of fucking crazy that these resorts are shutting down these faces for months in on a time just so this can happen. And I'm like, well, if that's happening and this is the free ride world tour, you guys got helicopters flying around and shit. You would just think in your brain, like there would be a little bit more of like incentive for the athletes to do it. You know what I mean? And that's to me is just like, if there was a two run format where you could go and lay down a, a, a lay down your tracks, right? Lay the paintbrush down and feel it out. So you can really paint that canvas second run. Cause like, I mean, you'll, you'll attest, dude, like, how is it from hitting something you never hit before to where if you can go and just hit it once and then you're on the chairlift or something and you're like, oh my God, dude, I'm going to fuck that shit Is it going to be too chewed up though after everyone goes their first run? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I mean, at half the lines. time, dude, you're competing on like shit fucking conditions. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like crunchy. Yeah, that's what Nils was it's not, saying. It's huh? not looking yeah. like a blower power run. It's always. not that no. ideal. And that's almost like, dude, if like, if you had the two runs, like, being able to, like, control your speed, run one, and figure it all out, like, because there's sometimes when the snow is shitty, dude, like, you'll land a jump, and if you're anywhere in the back seat at all, you're, like, gone. You're fucking gone. You're going real fast, and sometimes you can go be rolling real fast into the shit you don't want to be going real fast into. And it can, like, really get gnarly real quick. And, dude, it's just like, dude, like, fuck, you know? Like, I've I've done a lot in my ski career where maybe, like, there's some other people that compete in that shit that haven't and oh my god dude some fucking people ski the craziest fucking lines you'll ever fucking see like straight up riding over rocks yeah it seems landing on up fucking shit. rocks where i'm like dude i'm not from europe we don't do that here in the states we don't fucking go to snowbird and be like yeah let me fucking ride down that whole rock face and then go over traverse over here and then fucking 
ride down another like rock faces. These fools ride down rocks where I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like slanted dude. rocks that are yes. you're not you're not yes. airing them, you're just going yes. down. Yes, and like people yeah. will launch off of cliffs and land on like grass and rocks. Really? Dude, Marcus Eater last year in Fever Bruin did the biggest fucking backflip in his in run to like the top like the first thing he hit. Dude, he's going like fifty miles an hour into it. And the takeoff is just bumpy like Grassy fucking knolls with rocks in it. You can ski over that shit? Like Dude. windblown or some shit? Yeah, it's like iced over grass and yeah. rocks, and the rocks have like ice on it. So oh, you iced. do glide over it. But the rocks, in my mind, I would safe. fucking be like, oh <laughs> shit, like walking on eggshells while yeah. these Euros are like, nah, fuck, dude. That's like you go right over that. And I'm like, well, fool, I don't know that. <laughs> I, every time, like, I hit a rock, I fuck, <laughs> nothing good comes of it, dude. And you guys are backflipping onto, like, huge rock fields. Like, it's insane. That's crazy. So, as an American, like, you're going over there, and it was like, like talk about, like, humble pie, bro. Like, I thought I was going to crush it, and I got in there, and it was like, fuck. But that's a big thing. Like, I'd like to heal up from this, and, like, if fucking COVID's going to allow it, like, I'd love to have one more crack at that. Give tour. it another Hell try. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Um, we got into it with Nils when we were talking about this tour. The skiers, there's a lot of the backslap landings. One, is that a make in your mind as a skier? Because we don't, we don't really know. But he said in the world tour, there's a lot of those going down. Dude, they fucking have dudes. Like, there were some kids, like, fucking doing daffies and shit. And I was like. They don't do daffies anymore skiing, huh? That's almost so whack that it's like dope. Daffy? Yeah. 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 Maybe you should bring that back in a way. No, there's no almost. bringing that back. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost, dude. On the world stage. <laughs> what on about the world uh, fucking stage? Spread Eagles, are those still cool? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't La- know, dude. In last my, time I was in at- my brain where I came up competing and whatnot, dude, if you have your arm right here instead of right here. That's the, all the difference of like getting first or fucking tenth place, and now like there's there's back slaps, there's really high speed like running man like out of control, but it's like oh, the they, more they're, out they're of going con- so big they're throwing the running man down. or they're just going so fast and they're like in the back seat when they take yeah. off some cliff they're like holy shit and then they'll back slap and it'll bounce them like a hundred feet down the hill but they'll land on their feet. And their hands are up, and then all of a sudden, it's like, if you're the most... I, I felt like if the more out of control you are... And survive. And survive, and don't fucking eat it's shit. It's a move. Like, you're, yeah, you got it. Like, that's... They, they, they actually, like, reward that. You know what I mean? So that's another thing where I got to get used to. Yeah. But if I do well in the tour and I were to win, I'd like to do it my style where it's, like, it's undeniable. Where every trick you do, everything, everything is so just on point, you know? Because... Like, there hasn't really been a winning in at least the skiing like that. You know what I mean? It hasn't, like, but it's hard, dude, with that one run. It's really hard to have that type of confidence. It's really hard. I feel like if I was younger, it might have been a little bit different. Because you get older, and that's when you really start. You have to think about the shit when you're older. And talk about, like, going back to if I think too much is bad. And that's where, like, in a scenario like that, like, I learned... That once I know what I'm about to do, stop thinking about it. Because mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you're going to start just analyzing photos, and you're like, it's too much. Is that a, dude, that's a fucking pepper rock I didn't even fucking see. Like, okay, now i got to stress about that all night. And then I'm going to get in the start gate and be like, I'm not even going to hit that jump because there's fucking pepper in the yeah. landing while these Euro kids are doing fucking backflips onto, and like, rocks. And maybe it's not even pepper. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's that fine line of, like, knowing what you can do. And once you know you can do, it's like, fuck, just look at the face. And, like, what I didn't understand, some of these dudes go to, like, face check all day long, multiple days, where I'm like, yo, I can't do this. Like, I, I'm a film kid. What do they do? Well, this, they, they scope their line for multiple days, and, like, they'll hang out at the bottom of the course on scope days all fucking day long, where I'm like... So, all right, it takes me about, like, three minutes to find, like, what I want to shred. <laughs> <laughs> and they're there yeah, all day. Good. I'm going to go down that. 100. Well, it's like, you know, like, if you're on a heli trip or you, like, go on your snowmobile, like, to go ski some pillow lines or something, you get to the face, you're at the bottom, you're like, oh, yeah, fuck it. Hey, dude, I'm prominent lines, like, they poke stick out, at out. They yeah. stick out, you know what I mean? And I've never been the type of dude to just sit there and study and study and study. And they do that. They do. Wow. They really do that. And then they'll, like, take mad photos and go right from, like, looking at it to like being inside just to like put it on their computer to look at it all night to look at it again 
Where, you know, maybe that does help, dude. I don't know. But I think it would make me just go insane. Because, like, there's, a, like, you're, I'm the type of dude where if I stare at something for so long, I start seeing way too many options. Yeah, and you're going to question yourself. And the free route with when you got only one run, like, don't, don't add more to your plate that you don't need. That like, makes that's, sense that's, to that's, me. That's what I'm thinking. But I don't have the equation to that, dude. Like, watch, yeah. see, Nils came in, dude, and how Nils did it, it was fucked up. Like, never once did Nils have that, like, I'm going to win this tour. Like, it's basically a, sp- it's a, it's a marathon race. It's not a fucking sprint. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, like, you got to be able to, like, play your cards right. And, like, Nils' day at, at Feverbrune when they had to do two runs to, because they got canceled out on mm-hmm. Ordino. Like Nils, it was just he just like he he had fun. He he found his first run and was like, "Oh fuck, that felt really good." He had a really good first run, and that just that that just got him more stoked. Where I'm like almost looking at Nils, like how he won that whole tour was from that fever brune day because he had so much fun on his first run that he got into his film mentality and he was like, "I know exactly what I'm doing on my second run," and took that confidence from run one into run two, where I was like damn, dude, this second run fucking thing, like, please bring this in, you know? Because, like, if you're having, like, two, having two runs, too, can really bring a level of fun. Because, like, if you kill it your first run, you can't wait to go back up and do it again. You know what I mean? And I saw how Nils did it. Like, he never was like, yo, this is like, I'm going to win this thing. He's like, I'm just here kind of, like, checking this yeah, thing I'm just out. enjoying myself. Just, like, this is kind of dope. Like, never really thought I'd be here. And then all of a sudden, he was free ride world tour champion. That's so cool. Where I think on myself, I put a lot of fucking pressure on myself. Like, I'm the hardest person on myself. Yeah. Expectation's a killer, too. Mm -hmm. That expectation's, you can bring that into anything, and it makes it, you know, going in with the open mind versus going in expecting to win, those are two that'll change the whole experience. Totally. I don't know if I was expecting to win. Well, yeah, I was. I'm not going to lie. I was expecting to win the fucking thing. (laughs) (laughs) Not going to lie. I was. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, dude. Sometimes I, I'll be real. I'll watch. The, I'll be watching the shit and then watch some runs, and you're like, "Really? That's it? That's it? Like that's not that fucking crazy, you know?" But it's it's it, dude. And I and me too. I had that for so long, dude. I thought like the tour was kind of whack for that reason alone. But then you get out there though, huh? And you get out there, and it's serious. It's just fucking. It's a serious thing. It's just. It's it's yeah. It's 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 a mental game for sure. Are they having it this year with COVID? I mean, they're going to do Andorra and Feverbrune and Verbier, but, I mean, it's... See what happens. Dude, I'm on that Free Ride World Tour, like, WhatsApp chat list, and it just sounds like a shit show right now. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody really knows. High-risk country. If you're coming from this high-risk country, you have to call this PDF, and you have to find, sign this. You have to go get a notary. I'm just like, oh, my God, dude. Like, that sounds a like a nightmare <laughs> for Americans. Yeah, and some people got to quarantine. Oh, Yeah. So uh, I have another Patreon question for you, and this is about Chad's gap, which is an exciting topic for me. I was I was there that first day you got hurt as a spectator. Man, that was gnarly. Yeah. So the question from uh, Marco Ferris is, uh, I wanted to ask about the mental process of regaining the courage to hit Chad's gap again after your gnarly crash. How much did the crash affect you after healing up and hitting larger jumps gaps? 12 years to get back to Chad's gap seems like a long time. Some people may even say too long for an athlete. What made you decide to finally go back and demolish it? Ah, well, I mean, when I got hurt on Chad's, I was still at an age where I don't really, it, it like the severity of the injury didn't even hit me. I mean, fuck, I got hurt. And then 10 months later, I won my first ever super pipe gold medal at the X Games. 10 months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the perspective was just different. I mean, I was, I was fucking young, dude. When you're young, how old were you? Twenty one, twenty two. Yeah, and that's like that's that's your that's the age where it's just like you you you're on top of the world. So like when I hit, it was like kind of the same mentality now. It's just like not like if I'm gonna come back. It's just like how long do I have to wait until I go ski again? And so I mean, I had it in my brain though that I was like, God, oh, fuck, Chad's. I'm just over that jump and whatnot. And it's just funny. Like God has a funny way of working because at uh, twelve years later. It just, like, I was having such a good season, and it was fucking going so good in Tahoe. And then in my brain, I was like, fuck, I don't, I don't know. I had to go get, like, I think I had to renew my driver's license. That's what it was. And I was like, I had to go from Tahoe, and I went to Dillon, Montana, 
and I got that. And then, like, in Dillon, I was, like, way closer to Salt Lake than I was to Tahoe. So I was like, I'm just going to go see a couple of buddies in ta- or in down in Salt Lake and shred there for a couple of days. And right when I got there, I, like, linked up with Brent Benson. And I was like, fuck, dude, it looks like you guys just built Pyramid. And they're like, yeah, fuck, go check it out. So I went up there, and I hit Pyramid, and... Right after I hit Pyramid, I, I did a double backflip on Pyramid, and I was, like, started looking at Chad's, like, damn, dude, like, let's just fucking build this right now. It's like I had no intent of going and doing that. It was just, like, I came to Salt Lake for a couple of days, and, like, the day I got to Salt Lake, I'm, like, looking at people hitting Pyramid that day. And then the next day, it was your classic fucking just, like, kind of warm, slushy. It wasn't pow or anything, but, like, the landing was all bombed out, but then it got slushed over, so I was like, fuck it, let's hit it. And then Chad's just looked very pristine. It hadn't been built. It just was, like, looking nice. So, And Brent Benson, dude, like, he's fucking very, he's all about the gaps. And he, like, he's, he's if you even show any interest on wanting to do it, he's, it's like, gonna happen. it's going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I told him, I was like, should we do this? And he was, like, 100. And he got a whole crew together, and we built it up and and hit it. And it wasn't, it's just, like, I was, it, it was in, I was skiing really good. It wasn't like a, a, a nervous thing until like it was time to hit it. But there was a couple of Groms with us and I looked at him. I was like, you guys are fucking guinea pig in this shit. I paid my dues. I ain't, yeah. looking, I'm going to like know where to start from. So a couple of kids, uh, Tyler Pratt and uh, Seth, Seth Klein. Seth I think Klein. you went first. Yeah. 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 Seth Klein. Uh, shout out to Seth. I'm going to air horn. Big shout out to yeah. Seth, dude. That kid tried to dub his... back over it as well and just mm-hmm. clipped his tips and yeah. had like a pretty gnarly crash where kind of put him out the next day i think he sidelined i don't even think he hit it i think it was just me and taylor but yeah like day one i got a three over it just straight air and threed it and then i wanted to dub back but it i i, I did a backflip but opened up and like knew i wasn't like just something didn't feel right just didn't have enough pop and somehow like just stretched and just did the running man Thinking I was in the free ride world tour or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I started doing the running man and somehow like st- stretched it out enough where I, like I actually landed it and I didn't fucking have a gnarly rag doll. Cause like if you hit that jump and st- you start like getting off balance in the air, you're going so fast that it's hard to like get the, this is going to hurt out of the brain. Yeah. And like to not crash on that one, I was like, okay, like I'm done. But if we put a little bit more pop on this, like I can definitely do a dub and. We went back the next day, put some more pop on it. I did one straight air and then did a dub back, and that was it. Damn. Two hits? Yeah, two hits. Did you ever see uh, Sage Kotzenberg, when he went to Chad's, he wasn't sure how fast to go, so he screenshotted your GoPro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. That was <laughs> To sick. figure yeah, out where to drop it. To figure out where to start. He, like, you he looked at the bushes and all that. That's smart, dude. That kid fucking killed it on that one. That, Sage real good. So dope. So, uh, dude, you've done it all. You know, free red world tour, eight zillion X Games medals, uh, all the video parts, video projects. Fuck, I, I mean, I don't even know what I'm forgetting, but you've your own brand Armada, which we didn't even have, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Part two, we'll have to we'll have to get into that a little bit more on the business side of things. But uh, w- yeah, what's next, dude? What's going? What's next for Tanner Hall? Uh, well, I've been talking a lot about bringing an invitational back. Actually, I'd really like to create my own contest for. Kids that, you know, just that that goes on for a while, that's going to be a staple, you know what I mean? But I don't want to just do a normal contest. And I've, got a, a, I've been really trying to figure out a good thing, and this is what a big thing, just going through an injury like I am now, that I have a lot of time to sit down and think. And I'm going to start working with a company outside of Verbier. Well, that's based in Verbier. That's a clothing company. And uh, that's a big thing, like, in the talks of trying to figure out, like, if we were going to work together, that was a big thing. And... They were. They actually brought that up to me and kind of like put the idea back into my brain, where I was like, "Yeah, like that. That definitely is something good." So having my own contest is a big thing. I'd love to bring back the Tanner Hall Invitational and then just you know get back on my skis and you know I'd love to, like I said, take another crack at the World Tour and just you know I ain't getting any younger. And I know at some point in the next like five years that like that whole maybe contest mentality might be like not as strong as it is right now. And like injuries should get the hunger up. That's why I was like, wow, this might be like perfect timing to like have something great happen. So just got to take it day by day. And uh, number one thing is just trying to, you know, be cool on this thing and not have, not fuck up and like put my foot down and have something bad go, which I'm pretty good, dude. I've been through the injury thing. So like, I just want to heal up nicely, you know, figure out a contest, free ride world tour, 
and uh, keep chasing that feeling. You know, it's just like that's that's the main thing. Is like that's that's how I know what makes me happy. That's why I wake up in the morning. That's what makes me tick. Is like the skiing shit. So it's just getting back to it and like making sure I'm good with and learning to be good with what I've done. You know, I'm I'm terrible at that. Like I'm terrible. Like I'm I'm so critical on myself more than anybody else in the world. And it's just like trying to like self respect and self love more, and actually being okay with like the things that I've done and s- instead of looking at it like oh, I sold myself short here. It's like well actually you know maybe you've been looking at it at like a whole wrong way. So just keep growing as a person and trying to become a better version of myself that I already am. Well said, right there, man. Beautiful. Be kind to yourself. That's great, great message. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming on to our show. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, guys. Learned a ton. And uh, thank you to our listener viewers. And we will see you guys again next week over and out from the bomb hole. Boom, bomb, connect.